So the cool thing about this, yes, as Mario said, great colors. These are Distress Embossing Glaze, 12 new colors of glaze. And I do love this palette because again, we've got some bright colors and then also some colors that are just a little bit more vintage and distressed. And I do love it. I think showing up good. Good. So uh, yeah, I mean, well, let's just say like, take a look at this display. How great is that? Yes, we did dump some powder into into the tin just for the lie, but we'll go ahead and I'll pour it back in the jar. Don't you worry, I'll be saving that. Um, but Distress Embossing Glaze, what's really nice about this is it is a translucent embossing powder. For those of you uh, new to this medium, it is a translucent powder. And I'm gonna go through a lot of different visuals because uh, I always go back and look at previous lives or demos that I've done uh, on a product. And I look to see what I've covered and I look to see what, hey, you know what? I think I could explain that a little bit different. So uh, this is the, swatch that I've shown uh, every single time I do a glaze demo because I do think it's the most impactful for people that don't quite understand the difference between an embossing glaze uh, and a regular embossing powder because it is embossing powder. I just called it glaze because it has a, a consistent property. And I'll say consistent because I can't really say it's a unique property because embossing powders all have different properties depending on the brand and the colors. But usually, I'll just say usually, Embossing powders are an opaque plastic. So when you look at uh, embossing powders, many of Ranger's embossing powders, these colors are opaque. Metallics are the same way. They're also opaque. When you say embossing gold, maybe it's the first time you've seen gold or silver embossing powder melt, right? That, that magic. But embossing powder is uh, opaque. So it starts out as a plastic, even these the same plastic. And when you melt them, they turn into a solid. And regular embossing powders do this. They have an opaque look to them they create a nice shine like for black embossing powder that's what we love as as card makers stampers mixed media now not all embossing powders though are opaque some are translucent some are opaque and what's weird is that you can buy colors from a same brand and it doesn't really call out whether it is translucent or opaque if, if you've been stamping or embossing for years you know what I mean. You've maybe seen a jar of red embossing powder. You're like, oh, this is cool. And you put it on a dark cardstock and it's not really red like this. It actually is translucent. So it looks a little muddy. And that was really the inspiration for Distress Embossing Glaze was creating a line of translucent embossing powders. So they're all translucent, but also not making the color as intense, even though it's translucent, because oftentimes if the color is too intense, you can't fully see through it. So this is the comparison. These are Distress Embossing Glaze over the same kind of inked background. And you can see that although you get that beautiful color, that great Distress, we can also see through it. And sometimes people don't really understand the value of that, to be honest. They just like, okay, it's a translucent powder, big deal. I, I don't really care. I, I prefer this kind. But this demo is really designed to showcase how you can use this feature, this, this property of a translucent glaze to your making creative benefit, okay? So the colors, the 12 new colors that we have added uh, to the palette, we have Abandoned Coral, Aged Mahogany, that is a beautiful dark red, uh, Spice Marmalade, Squeezed Lemonade, Super Bright Yellow, we didn't have a yellow in, in the glaze, Crushed Olive, one of my favorites because it is that dirty uh, green when it melts, Mowed Lawn, Bundled Sage, delicious. This is great for fall and also going to be for Halloween. Uh, Peacock Feathers, Mermaid Lagoon, Chip Sapphire, mmm, dark, dark blue. That's really almost a navy, I think, even though it is Chip Sapphire. Uh, Seedless Preserves, a bright purple. Don't be fooled by this powder because it melts uh, really uh, very similar to the ink color, great for Halloween. And of course, Pumice Stone because uh, I need a new neutral, I need a new grunge. Even though we just had uh, Lost Shadow with that light gray, uh, pumice stone is a little bit different. So when I swatch, because I do create swatches, I have swatches for all of my glaze. I always suggest as a maker, take the time to make swatches, really. It's a great way to fill in that, uh, that time when you have a creative block, you don't feel like making anything, uh, you don't have any uh, specific ideas of what you wanna do. You can certainly sit down and make swatches because at least you uh, get to work with your product. But more importantly, when you go to make something with it, you get a better idea of what the product can do. And for my swatches, uh, I work on just white cardstock. This could be watercolor cardstock, any kind of white cardstock that you like to use. I also work on uh, mixed media. So I work on tags, which is mixed media heavy stock. So that kind of has uh, that little uh, 
kind of yellow undertone, but not really. Mixed media is just more of a cream, I would describe it. And I also like craft because those are the papers that I work with. These are all distressed. So this is heavy stock craft, mixed media, uh, and watercolor. Now, as a maker, you might like to work on black a lot, or you might work on colored cardstock. Whatever papers you work on, that is what you should do your swatches on, because that's what's going to give you the result. And you can see just from uh, this first color glaze, the abandoned coral, and I just label mine, just print some labels. You can see how the same color glaze changes depending on your paper. Why is that? Well, because it is translucent. So you're going to take on the properties of whatever background you're using it on, whether it is an inked background, a painted background, a, a pattern background, doesn't really matter. Uh, and I like that. I really love the versatility of a glaze. And that's what makes me so excited about these colors. Now, aged mahogany, I mean, come on, that color, so, so good. Spice marmalade, really nice, uh, bright orange. Of course, squeeze lemonade, beautiful. Look at crushed olive. Anyway, we can go, oh, bundled sage. We could go on and on because as you can see from this palette, we do have like those dirty colors, but even your bright colors. So we take peacock feathers, for example, it does start out very true to color on white cardstock. But if we go into, uh, say, a different paper, it can change. It really takes on some great dark teal uh, undertones. Same thing like with the purple. This is what I was saying about, oh, there's chipped, chipped sapphire. See, it's kind of navy-ish, but then when you get it on a dark paper, it can almost go to like a, a dark black blue. Almost like a bruise. But take a look at Seedless. See, this is what I was saying. This is Seedless Preserves. And I said, don't be fooled by the powder. That's what's so important about swatches because you can look at that jar of powder and think, oh, it's going to be this dark purple. But then when you actually emboss it, you're like, there you are. Hello, Seedless Preserves. And then of course on mixed media, it's a little bit warmer. And then we have that dark tone uh, with craft. And then there's pumice. Mm -mm -mm. Pumice stone, delish. So these of course, will go into my swatch stack with everything else. I'll put them all in rainbow order. I just kept them out just for uh, the live, but I'll put them into general population soon. But you can see all those colors really have that kind of uh, fill in the gaps that we've done with this palette of, of where it is. And I'll probably do some posts on social uh, coming up in the next week of just like, you know, how these colors compare to the colors that are close to them in the glaze so you can really see the differences. But uh, trust me when I say that they are a much needed addition to the palette. So the glades themselves, how do I store them? I choose to store mine in the storage tin. You can do whatever you want as far as how you store in your creative space. You can store them on shelves. You can just throw them in a shoebox, whatever. Uh, but the just storage tin does fit 12 jars of glaze uh, or any of the storage jars. And you know, if you've watched uh, earlier lives, I use it for my distressed glitters and mica flakes. You can stand the jars up if you're going to do a swatch label. Maybe you want to do your swatches uh, and punch them out and stick them on the top because that's going to be an easier reference. Uh, you can also flip them over. I know some people flip them over just so you can see uh, the color, but you can also lay them on the side. If you do lay them on the side, the tin becomes a little bit congested, if you will. It gets a little packed, but I'm never bothered because I usually take out all the stuff anyway when I go to play. Okay, so speaking of play, Let's play. I'm going to move this tin out. I'm going to ask Mario to help me and get these jars out of there. If you don't mind just kind of taking them off sure. and just give them a quick dust, I'll use them. Uh, and right under here, I've got my glass media mat all set up. Let's make sure we're straight in here. Okay. So working surface, because we're going to be embossing, distress embossing glaze, uh, this is going to be a powder, a medium that you need to heat. You have to heat emboss. Hey, Sizzix is here, Vicky Booten. See Zoe here, Kathy. Hey guys. Uh, so I'm just going to take out, I hope I don't take out all the colors, but you know me, I probably will. But I know that I have uh, some definite favorites that we've done. Uh, oh, I do love crackling campfire. Let's put that one back for now. Oh, I do love that. Oh, I love lumberjack. I love them all. I have to be honest. I, I think having, having more colors of glaze, especially when you see how they work, hopefully this inspires you to get them out and, uh, have a little play. And also as a, thanks Mario, as a maker, I think it's also going to be important that even if you don't have a project in mind, or maybe you uh, aren't up to the, the task of swatching, just get out some colors and, and play. I'm going to move all these just off camera. They'll all be sitting here. 
I don't really know. I never really know how I how I want to go until I go. All right, with until the colors. Thanks, go. Mark. Until I go. So the labels. I will tell you this. When we first started uh, distress embossing glaze, this is how the label uh, looks, and I felt that the label was a little bit challenging to read. To be honest, you can see the colors in there. We made it look like the rest of distress, and over time we've revamped. Uh, the labels so you can see like when we do the new color and even all the new uh, colors that we do now it's in a band that has that that white printing so it's much easier to see and we'll be doing kind of a running change meaning uh, as ranger needs to make more of the older colors uh, they'll do it with this new label it's just much easier to read but just so you know if you happen to see them side by side and you think oh are they different no it's just a running change with the label because hey if we need to change stuff we will okay so when it comes to glaze we're going to demo all the different ways that you can use embossing glaze. And when I tell you this, when I talk about embossing glaze, I just want you to be aware that everything I share with you as far as mediums and surfaces can also be done with embossing powder. Okay, so if you're like, well, will this work with gold or will this work with the powder I have? Yes, it will. But the result, the look, because of its translucent property is what's going to be the cool factor that you may not get with a regular embossing powder. Okay, so let's talk about how you apply it and what you can apply it with. Well, anything wet, and you're going to see throughout this demo, we're going to apply uh, a lot of different mediums to get this powder to stick. Traditionally, when it comes to embossing, we think of embossing ink, and this could be uh, distress embossing ink, regular embossing ink, Versamark, that's an embossing ink. And embossing ink is a clear glycerin based ink. I say glycerin based because if you've ever felt, say, embossing ink or even Versamark, it kind of has like a slippery, kind of sticky feel. The reason this ink is made out of that is because it stays wet longer, allowing this powder or any embossing powder to stick to that ink, giving you time to then take an embossing gun, any type of heat tool. I work with an embossing gun when I am embossing because uh, this has a directional tip and it heats up really, really fast. But you've often seen in demos that I also love my Ranger heat tool. I use my heat it craft tool for everything else. Do I emboss with this? No. Can you? Yes. But because it's a larger opening and it diffuses heat, it just takes longer to emboss an area because the heat is distributed more evenly, which is why it's perfect for everything else. Inks, glue, paints, everything. But when it comes to embossing, because we need to melt this powder into a solid, I prefer something more focused. And often people go, oh, you know, this gun is hotter than this. Most often, most embossing guns, I mean, this one does happen to be hotter than this. I know that for a fact, but most uh, embossing guns and a heat tool are the same temperature. It's just the fact that this one focuses that heat and this one distributes the heat, kind of like being in the sun, right? It's warm outside, but if you're in direct sunlight, it's a little bit hotter, okay? So this ink, Try with whatever mediums you want, but we're gonna explore embossing with distress ink, oxide, sprays, uh, water, because yes, water is embossable as well. Any kind of moisture you can do uh, embossing glaze or embossing powder with. It's just your open time changes. And that is why I like regular embossing ink when I want a longer open time. Now, why distress embossing ink? Does it do anything special? Well, it's different than Versamark in the fact that it's not sticky and doesn't leave a sticky residue. Uh, I also like it because it smells good, and I've talked about this a lot. It just has a, a yummy scent that Ranger does, and to me, it's not as slippery. It's a little bit lighter. You can get it in an ink pad uh, with a reinker. You can also get it in an embossing dabber. This is different than the Ranger dabber. The Ranger dabber has a foam top. This one has a felt top. And you can also get it in embossing pens, and the embossing pen is brush or bullet. So if you have great handwriting or you want to tinting, uh, tint anything, you can also work with pens. All of these contain the same ink. It's just a different delivery system. And because of that, I always keep my dabber upside down because this stuff is like really thick sludge. Think of it like hand soap, okay? Because it's glycerin. So you need it to travel to the end. If you don't, and you try to force it out by squeezing the bottle, you will blow the lid off of this and it is one mess. So I'll leave it upside down, just kind of off camera because I'll be using it uh, occasionally. And how do you use what and when? Well, first let's just talk about the differences in how we can emboss and, and what we can do. So let's take a color. I know I did this swatch with bundled sage, okay? Bundled sage glaze. This is really uh, probably the most important lesson to start out with. 
Now this, because it is a tinted powder, it doesn't mean that you can only use Distress Embossing Glaze with Distress products. That's not true at all. You can use any kind of embossing powder. And in fact, clear embossing powder, this is Ranger's Clear. I love the big jar um, because I don't have to keep, I use uh, clear a lot and I don't need to put it in a separate container because it's got such a wide mouth to it. Uh, but this is traditional clear embossing powder. This is really nice because it does give you kind of that overall shine. But there is a distinct difference in how these look. And sometimes people just go, oh, it's exactly the same. You know, you don't really need that because if you have that color of ink, you can just use that ink uh, and use clear. Eh, yes and no. Okay, so let me grab something out of here. We'll take a bundled sage ink pad. I don't know if I have bundled sage oxide. I don't, but I'll just put an oxide pad here just so you can understand uh, these swatches that I created for you guys. Okay. Can we just talk about that splatter stamp right there? Yeah, this is a good stamp. So I, I like that. this. I like it for new swatches. It's re really fun. This is from Note Quotes. Uh, so this is a set that I did uh, this year with Stampers Anonymous. But I do love these splats for swatches. Normally I do use those long ones. Uh, but when I was doing this, I'm like, I love just a big splat. So that's what I did for this. Thanks, Mario. I do love that. Okay. Um, how long does embossing powder last? In indefinitely. Embossing powder lasts indefinitely as long as you don't spill it, dump it on uh, the floor, or leave it open, or decide to pour a glass of water in it because it's just powder. Okay, so you want to make sure that uh, when you're when you're using your embossing powder, you leave the lid on. And it's it is also different in different climates. I'll be honest. If you live in a very uh, high humid uh, climate, you'll notice that your powders might get very very chunky. Here in Arizona, it's pretty dry, so these powders stay. Uh, well, pretty powdery, but if you if you find in your area, because especially in the summer, if it's a lot of humid, uh, you can just give these a little shake to kind of break up those clumps before you use it. But don't be alarmed if your embossing powder has little clumps in it. Okay, so this first swatch, what this is showing is just what it says, ink plus clear, oxide plus clear, which means that I went in with uh, ink. So this first one is clear ink and clear powder. So that's my ink and clear. I'll get this out of the way for right now. Ink and clear. Then I did different colors of Distress Ink. So you can see when they are embossed, right? Those beautiful colors of Distress Ink and clear embossing powder. Now what's really cool is that even though we have the same colors in ink and oxide, they look different when you emboss them because ink is just a translucent dye. Oxide is a fusion of dye and pigment. So your color is a bit more intense and it's also a bit more opaque. So you can see here when I stamp with Distress ink and I emboss, I can see a little bit of that white paper come through. Not much, but a little bit because it's a dye. With oxide, it has much better coverage because this also contains a pigment. So you get more opacity, which means that your colors have a little bit more of a punch, if you will. Okay. So we're going to take this same kind of concept and just share how we work uh, with a glaze and how that changes. So I, I did the same colors. So I'll just talk. I don't think the color really is important for the demo, but I'll just talk about it. So this first swatch is clear ink because I did my swatch with bundled sage. This is bundled sage ink, crushed olive because I really love that. Twisted citron, really love that. Salvage patina because I really, really love that. And pumice stone. The color that I use doesn't really matter. I just wanted you to see how it can change. Meaning this is done with clear ink. So it's the same ink in the first swatch, but instead of clear powder, I used glaze. So this is how bundled sage looks just using clear embossing ink and glaze. It's that perfect match to bundled sage. This is bundled sage and bundled sage, meaning I stamped with distress ink in bundled sage and I embossed with bundled sage. So already you can see the same color of glaze. We use the same color of glaze for all of these. Just remember that it's the same color glaze. By changing my ink, I changed how it ultimately looks. So just right now, I'm able, just using my inks and different powders, I'm able to expand my palette. So this one, crushed olive and bundled sage, look at how it just makes that crushed olive a little bit dirtier. So let's say you're doing a project and you want something to have a little bit more of a tint to it. This is where glaze really becomes impactful because you can add a glaze to a color and change it up. Even down here, something super bright, super vibrant, super limey by adding a little bit of bundled sage, it tones it down some. I love this one. This almost looks like evergreen bow to me where it's salvage patina ink 
embossed with bundled sage glaze. Mm, loving that. Look at this pumice stone and bundled sage. That's for, for grunge brown lovers. Man, I'm telling you, uh, creating uh, any of your glaze over, over a dirty ink color dirties that glaze. But you see how like the color is still visible. You get those little patches of bundled sage and those little patches of ink, which is cool. So now I did the exact same thing, but I went to oxide. So same colors. So this is just clear because you have to do clear and clear. That's why these swatches are identical. Clear is clear. Um, but you can also switch it up. If you wanted to add a little bit of white, you could do white. And I'll talk about that in just a second. This one you can see when I used oxide. So this is bundled sage oxide and bundled sage glaze. Even those are different. So that's ink and glaze, oxide and glaze. So label your swatches, crushed olive, twisted, salvage, and pumice. So even by changing your inks, these are all done with the same color of glaze. You can see that I've created a whole different palette of stuff. So, so cool. Just to sit down and go, you know what? I'm going to take some inks that I, I like that I want to try. I'm going to take one color of glaze and I'm just going to make some swatches and I'm going to label them. And you might want to label your colors. I just happen to eat, sleep, dream, breathe these colors. So I know them in my head, but you might forget the next day or sometimes with me, it's the next hour. And so you might want to write down what your combos are, but it's so cool to say, Hey, I've got these inks and oxides and I only have a, a few colors of glaze. Wow. What could I do with this? It's pretty amazing how you can expand a palette just by uh, utilizing your glaze with different mediums, be that clear or be that ink or oxide. All right. Now let's take this a different direction. Just something that's a little bit more, not so same color kind of mess with your mind. Let's talk about, well, Halloween because I'm all for Halloween. Bring on Halloween code orange. You know it. I'm, I am Halloween shopping already because I love it. Um, that's right. And I do love this color. This is spice marmalade. Very excited to have this, especially for the Halloween season. When we're getting into Halloween and we're, we're getting into fall, it's very cool to look at some other things that we can create beyond just working with our traditional colors. So let's take a look at this swatch. So this of course stamped and embossed, right? I'm just kind of keeping it flat so you don't get uh, that shine. This we can see is embossing. So this is just embossing ink and spice marmalade. This, when I say same oxide, that means it's the same color. So this would be stamped in spice marmalade oxide and embossed with spice marmalade glaze. Look at how different that color is. It's almost kind of a ripe persimmon, but maybe not as bright. Okay. Now let's jump to this, a brown oxide. This could be any brown. This happened to be gathered twigs, but I love stamping in gathered twigs and embossing with, with marmalade. Look at that. Cause see how you get that great rust. So if you like doing grungy backgrounds and you want a rust and you want to change it, you can be mixing your yellows, orange, even your browns with different colors of inks to create these undertones of rust. Ooh, amazing. Black. Now black might surprise you where you're thinking, wait a minute, if, if I'm stamping in black and these colors are translucent, wouldn't it just be black? Uh, Ish. It depends on how black the black ink is. So this one is black oxide and you can see with black oxide, we still get some of that orange showing through. It's kind of a, a mucky, but it's still very orangish black, which I think is great. But if your ink goes very black, very dark like this black soot archival, you know, from watching previous demos, how dark this ink is. And yes, archival is impossible as well. So if you have any colors of archival ink, not just distress colors of archival, but any Ranger archival ink is impossible because this is oil based. So this one is stamped with black archival and embossed with spice marmalade. You might argue that you can see a little bit of an orangey hue, but not nearly as much as I did with oxide because the black oxide, if you've ever worked with it is not truly as intense as black archival. But right there, just taking one color of glaze and just changing it up, creating that swatch, even you don't have to do this kind of swatch for every color, but it's going to remind you if you're working with any color, you're like, oh, this green is a little bit bright. Oh, you know what? Let me actually use it with the same color green ink. Oh, that's going to make it a little darker. Oh, I want a little dirtier. Let's go brown. Okay, that's too dirty. Let's go a lighter brown. Maybe it's antique linen. Maybe it's frayed burlap. You see what I'm saying? By having just one thing, 
it should hopefully trigger your mind to remember, hold on, I can use all these different kind of inks and look at how it shifts one color from just using clear. Really, really important, okay? So far, so good. Hope I'm not losing you here. We're, we're gonna get into this stuff, but I want you to understand it because as you watch it, you might be like, wait, how did, how did that turn to that? Okay. As I mentioned, I work on different surfaces. Craft is one of my favorites. I love heavy stock craft because it is a 130 pound craft paper. If you like to work on craft, be warned, okay, that not all craft paper is created equal. And I'm not saying this is the best. Okay, I am saying it's the best because I think it is the best um, because I like its thickness. Craft paper, because it's recycled, uh, is very porous. And I know sometimes as makers, we like to upcycle. There's nothing wrong with that. We take, you know, brown paper bag or we take brown packing paper and you go to emboss on it. And when you heat up the embossing powder, it like it's gone. It almost gets sucked in or absorbed into the paper. Well, that that's to be expected because that paper is porous. And when you heat this and melt it, it becomes a liquid and that paper just absorbs it. This is what I love about craft heavy stock. You can see that I can still emboss on this, but because of its thickness and its finish, it doesn't absorb my powder as quickly. Could you get it to absorb? Heck yeah, you could get any paper, even watercolor paper to absorb your, your powders. You just have to heat them so long that they literally become liquid that they just absorb into it. All right. So this one, uh, I love the fact that I can heat emboss it. I don't have to worry about it disappearing right away. Here's the purpose of this particular swatch, which I think uh, is super important. Uh, Mario's pointing out a comment from Yvonne. Mario, does he make craft paper? Yes, this is Distress Craft Heavy Stock. This is through Ranger. This is the 130 pound uh, craft. This stuff right here. It's the good stuff, right? Good stuff because it is thick, thick stuff. And I think what's really important is to really understand the weight of paper because um, that, and with everything, whether you're using, you know, powders, inks, any of that. So what I wanted to do on this one is take a powder. Let me, this one's peacock feathers. So let me just find the glaze. There we go. The new peacock feathers. And I'm like, I wanted to see what it would look like on craft and how could I manipulate this? How could I alter this color? So the first thing I did was take clear embossing ink and emboss with glaze. Now for this one, I actually swiped the ink that I used underneath it. I swiped in clear. You can see it, it's there, but it's clear. So this is what clear ink and clear glaze looks like on craft. Not bad. It has, a, it has some color to it. You can see that tint, no different than, you know, when we mixed a glaze with a little bit of brown ink, it takes on some of that tint, but it certainly isn't very vibrant. Then I wanted to do peacock feathers with peacock feathers ink. Well, it's no surprise that it became a more intense version like it did here. So see, it's all, it's pretty much the, similar to what we did here, but a different paper. So it changed everything. So because it made it a more intense version of this, it actually made it darker, darker. So you don't notice nearly as much of the peacock feathers. And you might be scratching your head going, I, I don't get it. Well, because when you intensify a color and it's translucent, you're just putting something darker on something brown, which then makes it almost black. So then I'm like, okay, I know what to do. We're going to switch it the other way. We're going to do an oxide because that pigment is going to brighten it up. Then we started seeing that color shift. We started seeing it come back a little bit, but because it still has a lot of blue green into it, this had a little bit more of a, of a blue green into it. That's okay. I didn't mind it. I actually like that. I like, I like that it's brighter than where we started. And then I thought, how can I get the most intense color or as close to the glaze as possible on craft? Well, that would be stamping in white. And there is a white distress ink. It's called Picket Fence. Uh, it's a very confusing one. I've said it again many, many times for years because this ink existed long before Oxide was even a product. And so technically it would fall under the Oxide category, but not really even because it doesn't have any dye. It is just a white pigment ink, pigment based, but it's not that wet, thick glycerin based pigment ink that you see in a true pigment pad. It's not spongy. It's still a felt pad. Uh, and it was actually the, the inspiration or the catalyst to do oxide of like, well, what if we did picket fence in colors? Could we mix this with a color and, and oxide was born? So, but the nice thing is because it is a white ink and it dries fairly quickly, it has the same drying time as an oxide. It allowed me to stamp in white and emboss in glaze. 
And now we can see that we just essentially put a white undertone behind that glaze, which brought us closest to the true color. So when you think, oh, with glaze, you can't use them on dark paper. Not true. Not true at all. You just have to be mindful of what is your base ink that you're using, depending on the result that you want. Again, with all of these samples and swatches, there is no right or wrong way to use it. It's just if you understand your mediums, you can just take this palette and go, oh my gosh, this one glaze could essentially have 70, 80, 90 different tones to it, depending on what paper I use, what ink I use, how I base it, and that's really what we're going to play around with uh, in the demo. Okay, really, really crazy fun to work with uh, all of these different colors and mediums. So that's the swatch overview, and we're going to go in and, and create. So we're gonna talk about embossing glaze and all the different things that uh, you can use it on because you can use it on paper, you can use it on wood, you can use it on metal, you can use it on glass, plastic. It just depends on how you prep that surface. So you can't have a blanket statement and go, yeah, it works on everything. Well, yes, it does, but not the same way. Like you can't use the same ink or the same foundation for everything. And that's what the demo is going to hopefully share. So here we go. I'm going to clear this up. Now, one thing to note, see, I've got a little bit of uh, embossing glaze on my glass mat. If you work on a glass mat and you work with uh, embossing, you might want to get yourself a Swiffer or something like that, because I think that that's really going to, to help kind of take off uh, that static charge. And you can work directly on the glass if you're going to work with the glaze. But the, the glass, I will tell you this, it does have a, a pretty significant static charge all the time. Any glass mat with embossing, it leaves those uh, little granules. So I'm just going to work on uh, a craft mat. So I'm just going to peel that off. That's the one that comes with uh, the mat. And then I'm just going to use the media surface mat. You don't have to use this media surface mat. You can work directly on your glass. You can work directly on whatever surface you want. But this one uh, is just going to make it much easier. So I'm just taking the corners and I, I just like to stretch it in the corner first. It's just going to make it easier to clean. But both uh, surfaces are heat stable. So I just want you to know that I'm not putting this down because, oh, I need to protect it for embossing or anything. I'm just taking that silicone backing. But notice I also dusted this off because I don't want any particles <laughs> dropping underneath this. Okay. Air bubbles are just par for the course because this is going to come off. Okay. Let's go into, let's go into it and off we go. So when we work with different mediums, I'm just going to start with some backgrounds and then we'll have some stuff to to work on just to give you an idea of creating backgrounds because i'll be honest i have an entire bucket full of backgrounds that we're going to talk about so adding color adding ink to a background pretty pretty simple i'll take some oxide so again an oxide is a dye and pigment i'm using an ink pad so i have to smash that color down if i want to put ink i can do the same thing ink because it is a dye is just going to give me more colorant more vivid color and maybe because I'm gonna want a little touch of brown, I'm going to use a little bit of brown. I'm just going to work on distressed watercolor cardstock. It could be any paper for your background, just doing background basics. If you didn't want to use ink pads, could you go in and use sprays? Absolutely. We could take our sprays and do the same thing. Could you do paints? Yes, you could do the same thing uh, and use paint. It doesn't really matter. Uh, this isn't so much a background demo, but I always want to start just to show people how easy it is just to create some color. I'm going to take some water and I'm just going to spray this until I create droplets. That's why I want to work on this surface because this surface handles ink differently than the glass. If I sprayed water on the glass, uh, all of these colors, instead of beading up like this, would start actually migrating together uh, and make a mess. So here I'll just work on some paper, just dip that in and we're going to dry it. So I'm using a heat tool because I'm working with ink. Just doing a little drying, pretty simple. Okay, and remember you can move things around. So just because the paper is like that, if you want that little drippage, pick up your paper, make it go where you want it to go. You wanna create that line. Some people just like to, you know, cook their paper and just stare at it. And you can, no judgment there. You could do whatever is gonna work for you. All right, next. I'll dab in this. Okay. Ooh, look at that. There's our next layer. Okay. Let's see. Let me try to get that off. There we go. I don't know if that helped. If that made it darker or lighter. 
Is that better? That looks a little bit better. I don't know. Felt a little bright on the screen to me. Okay, so this is our second layer of color. And you can see that each time that I'm drying, I'm creating a whole new layer. So if you're like, why are you dabbing, drying, dabbing, drying? This is what's building all of these layers and keeping everything from becoming uh, muddy. I introduce mud because I love brown. So to me, that's really going to be uh, important. But I've noticed all, already that a lot of this color, because I used oxide, is creating this milky, creamy look. And that's okay, mind that, but I still want a little bit more color. So I'm going to add uh, ink back in and add a little bit more salvage patina. I don't want to put it in the same oxide area, but the nice thing about this mat, I could just pick a new landing spot, smash some of that ink in there. Still want to spray it with a little bit of water because that's what's going to create the droplets. Because I also don't want to go into this big pool of blue, I'm just going to take my fingers and break it up. You can just wipe the ink off your fingers really quick. And this will allow me, see, to splash into that and pick up some blue dots. If I didn't break it up and I just went in, it would create, well, a pond or a lake. There you are. Yes. I do like to introduce mud, Vicky. It's important to me because Listen, by doing that, then it, you totally get over your fear factor of creating mud. But also, I, I like a little bit of brown. And you can do that. And if you, you embrace that, I think it's good. Okay. And it also creates, to me, it creates some other undertones into this background that, that we can achieve. Okay. I'm going to keep going, keep adding some layers. And I like having a bigger area, I'll be honest, uh, because it does, it allows me to kind of well, think of it as a palette. I've got brown over here. I've got oxide over here. I've got color over here. So knowing your location, you can also uh, jump around and kind of see what you have. There we go. Okay, let's see. Let's, let's go back to this and see. Nope. Look at that space. Just trying to get some lighting going on. There we go. That's better. All techy around here, huh, Mario? Oh, it's nice. Oh. Well, we just, we really tried, I, we struggled a lot with the, the lives and the camera setup and lighting and, and, and doing that around like a functioning studio space. So we're working it, we're working so it. So many. Okay, so right now we're just building up layers and this is what our background's turning out to be, which I, I'm okay with it. That's totally fine. Okay, so when we have this, now we're gonna just talk about some embossing, just so we have a, a clear understanding of what we can do with glaze because when you, when you understand the basics, then you, you're not going to be shocked or surprised by any of the other stuff because you think, well, gosh, if it does it with that, it's got to do it with everything else. Okay. So I've got a little bit of that. We're just going to take a cloth, just wipe this, these ink spots off. Just going to dab off that little bit of brown because that's going to give me a white space if I don't, if I don't dry it completely, which I'm happy with. So let's take this and I'm going to take a um, blending tool. Don't judge that it's got a dirty blending tool. It's not, it's not going to contaminate anything, but there is some brown on here because, well, no surprise, I like that. And let's say you, uh, this is just another thing. Let's say you're limited to blending foam. First of all, if you take a blending foam and you put it in another color pad, you will not contaminate your ink pad that way. You just can't. Blending tool, when it uh, was designed with this foam, it's really designed that you could actually double dip. Uh, you might stain the top of your ink pad, but you'll never contaminate it fully. But let's just say you don't like that idea. Just remember, if you have some type of, of matte surface, like a craft mat, you can still put the color there and then just pick up the color and blend that way. So if, you, if you're just like, yeah, no matter how many times you tell me, I am not going to double dip. Okay, well, just smash out some color. And this is just going to give me kind of a, a bluey brown. Salvage patina is a very light color, so I didn't anticipate it being, you know, full intense, but I wanted to just create a little bit of muck here because this is what I'm going to do. We have a background that is dry. And if you're not sure if it's totally dry, you can just keep going dry, dry, dry. You can give it a cook or you can just let these set aside and you can come back <laughs> and I don't know, use your backgrounds tomorrow or next week or next year, whenever you have backgrounds. I like compartmental making, so I would do backgrounds, then I would do glaze, I would do whatever. But this is a dry background. So what we can do is we can take some water and we can create some splatter. So I'm just going to take this and slowly squeeze the trigger. So if I, if I squeeze quickly on the Distress Sprayer, it's going to give me that nice mist. 
But if I slowly squeeze it, can you see those little raindrops? That's what we're going for. We're going for the raindrops, the drips that we want to put uh, onto the background. Now, some people use a, a brush, that's fine. Some people use their finger, that's fine too. I'm just gonna create some drips on there. And I'm going to dry this as well. This is just gonna give us a, a whole nother, another texture, if you will, to our background. The water is going to immediately react with everything that we have down there, the blended ink, uh, even the ink that we layered. That's the benefit of Distress. It will always be water reactive. It does not matter how many times you utilize it. It will always, always be water reactive. So now you can see our background just has a little bit more depth. And you may not like that. You may not like what the water did. So if you didn't like what the water did, well, what else could you do? Okay, well, we could take some stain. The, the whole purpose of me doing a background to begin with is because I'm going to be pulling in a lot of backgrounds that I've already done. And I don't want people thinking, oh, well, I have no idea how to get started. I'm going to use a spray. If I spray directly on this, I'm going to spray directly on this. I don't really want that. I just want some color. And spray stain is a fluid version of an ink pad. But you saw when I smashed my ink pad how little ink I got. But with one blast of a spray, look at how much ink is there. It's a lot. So I do like working with sprays if I'm, if I'm often working on a background, but same rules apply. Meaning if I put this in that bullseye of color, it's going to give me a bullseye of color. So I want to break it up. And I also want it a little bit more fluid. You don't always have to add water, but just a little bit of water allows me just to break that up. Just going through with your fingers. If you wipe it off, yeah, it'll stain them, but you can always wash your hands later. When you're playing, just play. But see, this is just going to allow me to uh, add a little bit more color there. Now our background to me has a little bit more depth. I can always, again, add some water just to create a little bit more movement. All right, now I'm happy with this. And I'm just going to show you what we're going to do with glaze because you might be thinking like, get on with the glaze, Holtz. Like that's what we're watching. Right, but you've already seen glaze on all of those swatches, which was just plain paper. How do you use it with things that you might already be wanting to do? And there's a lot of different ways that we can utilize this. So when I want my paper to be fully dry, it's a good idea to try to hold it in your hand. Maybe you want to use um, your fingers. Maybe you want to use a clothespin. Maybe you want to use one of these little grippy guys. Ranger has these. Um, they're nice. It's a little silicone hand that won't melt, but it'll hold on to your paper. But my point is by letting heat go through your paper, you will dry all the moisture out of it. And if you want to test this theory, just take a piece of paper, spray water on it, leave it flat on your table and heat it. And when you take it off, you're going to see this cloud of moisture that sits there. Okay. By letting the heat go through your paper, you're actually drying it much more efficiently than if you just had it on your, uh, on your craft table. Okay. So there's our background. Pretty nice. Here's what we're going to do uh, with the glaze. We're going to start, as I mentioned, with the most basic use of moisture and that is going to be water so it could be spray stain it could be in any of the stuff that we did before but i'm just going to take some water i'm going to spray some in my hand and i'm just going to give it a couple of flicks just flicking some water droplets on there then what i'll do is i'll take a color of glaze let's do a little let's do a little pumice actually because i think that's just going to be a, a nice brownish look to it I'm going to take the powder and I'm just going to pour it onto the background. Pour, be generous. I have a piece of scrap paper underneath. And what I'm doing is I'm just using the jar just to kind of tap the back. You could, some people like to be flickers. You could be a flicker if you want, but this is what we have. Can you see those brown spots? That's why I chose this color. Those brown spots, even that little bit of, of edge, that is where the glaze is actually adhered to water. But here's the thing about using water. Once you put that glaze on, you have to melt it right away. The reason is the water has no adhesive properties whatsoever. So if you waited, I don't know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes to go in and heat emboss, that powder would just blow right off because there's nothing sticking. Does that make sense? The powder would just come off. So I'm the water is what's holding onto that glaze, allowing me to go in and heat it and melt it. You see that? And sometimes 
you'll even if you're doing it really quick you might be like oh tim but i did it fast and i didn't get a lot of stuff okay well maybe that's because your paper was too porous remember i mentioned that if your paper's porous and you flick the water the water just dripped right in okay and you see that i embossed over here so i didn't have to worry about putting my glaze away so i'm not like embossing right over here because it would blow everything away but this is what I ended up getting. Like, take a look at that. See this glaze right there? All those cool little glaze spots just done with water. And this could be done through a stencil. This could be anything. But it's very, really, it's very nice um, to add texture in unique ways. And we're going to talk about that as well. So that's just doing a little bit of water splats. If I want to do more, well, I can do more. Take that. I can maybe drip some bigger drips right in that little corner. Same thing. Take my paper go over to the glaze, pour it over the top. And depending on how long this dries, you could even get little outside ripples. You know, sometimes when I'm doing this with ink, I'll, I'll go ahead and apply this and not even let this dry all the way, right? It will have a little bit of moisture to the edge and then you get that kind of outline. That's very cool to do with different powders. And like I said, you could do this with glaze. You could do this with metallic embossing powder. It's not just the glaze that's adhering to the water. It's any kind of embossing powder. I will also say that this technique actually takes longer to melt the powder than anything else. Why? Because what I have to do is evaporate the water underneath that before that glaze will even start to melt. There it goes. See how it's melted now? And it's weird because if you've done embossing for years, you're like, why is this taking so long? It's because remember, if you're using water, that water underneath has to evaporate before that glaze will melt. But again, it's just a cool effect, a great way just to add, see that little bit of shine? And that's what I like about the glaze because it's actually, well, I've talked about this before. I love age spots on my work. I love just those darker spots, really great. But if you wanted this to be metallic, you would just do the same thing uh, and put gold embossing powder or silver or whatever it is that you want, okay? And when you're done, just take your glaze. I just work on a piece of, uh, copy paper. Some people use trays, all sorts of things, whatever is going to work for you. I just do this so I can use that same piece of paper. Um, I just kind of shake it off. I have a trash can underneath me just so I could reuse it for uh, the catch again. So I'll use it again. Now I can put the lid on and now I can be done. So that to me is the basics of embossing. Now let's get into more things. There's a lot of different ways that we can use glaze to really alter what we do. This is done just with glaze. I'll show this technique. It creates a, an aged effect. Glaze can be also uh, a great way that we can alter our embossing. If you have embossing folders and you just do embossed cardstock, this is a Sizzix embossing folder on craft stock. Look at how great glaze totally changes, even in embossed paper, which is magical. Look at how great glaze makes that paper it just turns it into tile it's it's incredible and play around again with different colors because this is a color craft stock i'm like oh you know what is it gonna look like with cracked pistachio oh what is it gonna look like with bundled sage so you can still play around and create swatches with this the other thing to note is if you ink your paper you're also going to get a different effect and in true tim style there's one thing i don't have mario in the third drawer in that glass cabinet on the far left can you take uh there's a tool that has a little bit of sandpaper third drawer down no that's the second one there you go all the way to the left there you go yep no that's steel wool the one with sandpaper there you go well even the best directions still need a little bit of clarification thanks mario so this this is just a sanding disc so these are the new uh, sanding discs that fit your blending tool it's a great flat disc but that's how I achieved this kind of grunge result. This part has just been embossed. So I'll take that disc. I love this because I can lay it flat, go in a circular motion, and look how, look how great that sands embossing. Oh, so good. Could you just use regular sandpaper? You do you, all right? I just like this because I can actually uh, work on with the contour of the design without just sanding and sanding. So just gonna wipe that off just with a cloth. So this is what it revealed. Mmm, that core. This is craft stock from Ideology. Uh, this, by the way, for those counting the days, this is the same disc that I started with when these launched. And I don't even know when that was. Maybe that was, I don't know, March, April, who knows. But I mean, this, I don't know what the sandpaper is. It's resilient stuff. Okay, 
Now I'm going to go in, add a little bit of ink just to kind of show you how I got to that brown. So I'll take a little bit of uh, walnut stain distress. Ah, look at that. And I won't ink all of it. I'll leave that part open just so you can see what the glaze does. See how it just immediately soaks into that sanded area? Mm -mm -mm. So good. Okay. Wipe that off. Now let's glaze. Let's glaze for days. I think I'll do, I will do a little bit of bundled sage on this. I think that's going to be just a nice, a nice tone for this one. Uh, could I take my ink pad, my distress embossing ink pad and smash it on there? Yes. But if I have a dabber, that's what the dabber is for. The dabber is uh, allowing you to just go in and quickly cover. So the dabber has a little valve in here. See, I can push that in. It's a little spring dabber. So when you use it, that has to always be pressed down to open the valve for this sludge to seep out. Okay. It's not a fluid. It's not a, I mean, it's fluid, but it's not a liquid. So it's not just going to ooze everywhere. And often when people do this yet, yeah, please don't judge the, the grungy tip because I put it through ink or whatever. You can always say, look, it cleans itself off. It's good. Um, but I just swipe this over the top and there's plenty of ink on there. See, some people think that you really need to like frost a cake here. You don't any kind of moisture. If we can emboss with water, just the slightest amount of embossing ink will emboss. And truth be told, when people are doing cards, let's just say you're doing basic stamping and embossing. If your embossing looks like a hot mess, that's on you. That's because you put so much of that embossing ink on the stamp because you wanted to make sure it would stick that you, when you stamped it, you had this gross buildup around your image. And if you've done it, you know, just what I mean, where you stamp a little word, happy birthday, and you stamp it. And when you emboss it, it looks like you've got this little donut outline. That's because you had way too much ink on your stamp. When you're inking a stamp, you can just lightly swipe embossing ink because it's so thick. Your open time, meaning the amount of time you have when you use embossing ink to putting powder on, we're talking in the minutes, three to five minutes. So it also gives me more time to do different colors, different areas, all of that. Yeah, I, I see that Bridget. That's what I said. Don't ever squeeze the dabber uh, if you're not pushing down on it because you'll hear a nice pop and then you'll be scooping all that sludge back in the bottle. Been there, done that as well. So you can see, I mean, look at how like that glaze not only covered it, but it stuck on there really, really well. This, because I still have that open time, it's going to give me time to also put the powder back because I, I know I'm not going to need to get into this. There we go. Easy, easy. Put the lid on and off we go. Another reason why, uh, like I said, this you'll see if you have one of these, um, use it, especially with embossing because you just don't have that static mess on a glass mat. It's like sand on the beach. Okay. So for embossing, can I emboss right on my table? Yes. If you emboss directly on your table, and again, I'm even talking to just simple card makers as well. And I say simple, meaning all you're doing is embossing for a card. I don't mean what you're doing is simple. No judgment here, but you'll notice that when you go to emboss, your paper starts to create a bow, a curve, right? Often if you're embossing a card, your, your card turns a little bit like a chip. That's because when you heat directly on a surface, heat rises. So you're putting heat into the paper and it's trying to come out from the sides. And that often makes your paper do this as you're embossing. And then you're like, oh, I need to flatten it, tape it, put it under a book, whatever. If you can get in the habit, whether you're using again, your fingers, a clothespin, whatever, anytime you're embossing, even if it's a word, if you can get in the habit of just holding your paper and letting the heat pass through it, I'll show you. It embosses almost instantaneously because the heat passes through the paper. I don't have to now warm up my table, my surface, any of that. And that's often what adds to the embossing time is that when you're embossing on a table, you're not only heating the powder, but you've got to heat up that table to conduct the heat, allowing it to melt. But when you hold this up, it passes right through it and melts it super fast. Look at that, that glaze. So you can see just a totally different color of how that changes and really does make that embossed paper and that little bit of grunge. Let's, let's not kid ourselves. That really adds to, in my opinion, the depth of this, even if you're not into the whole dark brown, it could be something else. It could be whatever it is that, that you want to create. Beautiful. I love the glaze and the glaze does have uh, a very high shine to it. It is a high shine embossing and I, I love it. So there we are. Very nice. Okay. 
But speaking of shine, and we're going to send Mario back to the same location. So Mario, <laughs> third drawer. But that first tool that you picked up, okay, <laughs> All right, there we go. This is not something that is sold, but it's something uh, that is a good tip. So this is steel wool. Yeah, you can pick this up anywhere you want. Steel wool sticks to Velcro. So if you take a little bit of steel wool and you kind of ball it up, you can stick it onto a tool. I don't, I don't like the feeling of steel wool. Um, it, it's gross to me. I don't know what it is. So I like it on this little tool. And you can see mine's pretty, pretty shot up, but you can, you can fold it onto itself and it just pushes on there. So, I mean, that's okay. But here's the cool thing about steel wool. If you ever created a project and you liked the glaze, but you wanted it dull, okay? Maybe you don't want the shine, but you still like the saturation or the intensity. You can take steel wool and you can go over that embossing glaze. Still working on that paper because you get those little, those little fragmenty bits. Let me just wipe that off. And you can see here that it dulled that area. You see here where the, like, this is where there's glaze, but there's not the shine that you have over here and you can keep going with steel wool and you can make this as dull as you want. So it doesn't make it flat right away. It just kind of creates that matte finish. Someone just asked, why is it called glaze when it seems like embossing powder? Kenzie, that I talked about that right at the very beginning of the live. Um, it's really about its translucent property. And so I just named it glaze because it reminds me of a glazed donut and the glaze is always clear, but it is embossing powder. It's just a line that has uh, translucent property consistently. So beautiful. So, oh, thanks. I saw Heather jumped in there. So, but yes, it, it is important to understand the properties. And I also think by, by naming something, it's not gimmicky. It's just so you understand like, okay, glaze, that's going to be the translucent one. So that's just another little tip. If you don't like the high shine, but you still like the saturation steel wool, really cool. Oh, I rhymed. Didn't mean to. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on to some different ways that we can um, work with glaze. We can work with glaze over a pre-existing background. These have been uh, inked and stenciled. So I'm going to play around and show you on, on this one how to create this effect. Okay? I love working with embossing glaze and stencils as much as I like to use it with stamps because you can do a lot of cool things. This was just uh, when I did a print with a stencil and created a background. And you can utilize this in many different ways. This happened to be the open part of a stencil. Um, let's go ahead and do that. I think that's what I will do. I'll, I'm not going to do this one. I'll, I'll start with something fresh. I'm just going to take a pre-inked background and we'll play around with this. Because it's glaze, it does allow you to do a lot of really cool things with your backgrounds. So we'll take a stencil, see what I got here. Um, maybe I'll just do something I don't want to do something simple with dots. Never fails. I could, I could have a million stencils prepped, but my brain is telling me that I want something totally different. Huh? Do you want something to that? That's just what it is. Well, because I think on this particular background, I think it's going to be pretty if I do a flourish and the right image. I want something, I want something that's going to have definition versus pattern, if that makes sense. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, now I talk glazed donuts. It, it does make me want a glazed donut, so. There's that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just going to take uh, a stencil. We're going to lay this here. We're going to play around with color. We're going to utilize this. But first, I think I'm going to add some imagery. Let's do that. I like the look of that. Let me find a stamp here. Uh, there we go. That's a good one. We'll take just something with handwriting. And I, I used this one. We're going to create a background because one of the great things about this example is you see the text that goes through. The great thing about adding embossing glaze is that we can still see the writing that goes through this because the powder is translucent. So I'm going to stamp on this background first, just using some text. So we'll take this and I will stamp in some archival. Now, depending on how you want your words to, to really show up here, I'm just going to haphazardly stamp, meaning I'm just going to ink and go. I'm not going to try to uh, make sure everything is perfect. I'm not going to even use the same amount of pressure uh, when I stamp because that's going to allow that image just to be a little bit more, well, worn and weathered. See that? So starting proper inking and stamping, and then just when you become a little bit more haphazard with it, then you get 
a little bit more of a weathered effect. That's what I like. Okay, I'm going to wipe, wipe this off and off we go. So once we have a background image, knowing what we know, and that's why it was really important that we started everything, everything is for a reason. Because I stamped in archival, we already know from the very beginning of this demo that archival is impossible. So if I put glaze on this already, it's going to stick to my writing. I don't want it to. So I'm going to go in and dry this with a heat tool because I want to make sure that my ink is not going to hold on to the glaze. And it doesn't really have a drying time because people say, well, you know, how do I know if it's, if it's dry? You don't, but heat should just, even just a couple minutes with heat should, should help. So I know that this is going to be set. Now we'll go in with our beautiful background. Now uh, you can see here on this background that I've got some colors of blue and teal. So let's pick some glaze colors. Let's do a little bit of, well, I can do some cracked pistachio. I can do a little bit. Here's what I, I know what I'm looking for though. I think I will do a little bit of speckled egg up here. I think that could be pretty. Could do a little bit of broken China. That's not gonna be bad, but I'll also do a little bit of peacock feathers because I think that would be nice. But what I am looking for is a little salvaged, but I don't seem to find it. I probably put it, oh, there's a little bundled sage over here. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're just going to choose some colors that are in this background-ish or that we like that we could come off. Does archival wipe off the mat? Yes, archival will come off the mat. Um, you can wipe it off or you can use hand sanitizer or any type of alcohol. So this, because it's still kind of wet, I got most of it off, but you can just take hand sanitizer and it will come off. So I'll clean it at the very end. But yes, if you kind of wiped it off, then we're good. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a stencil. I'm going to put some embossing ink on it because I want to put my glaze over here. But what I'm going to do is I'm gonna color the areas with different colors of glaze. That's gonna be my, my background pattern. Okay, there we go. I told you the one that I didn't take out I'm gonna want and that's how it works so what I'll do just kind of move some of this stuff out of the way just to not confuse what we're working on I've got my colors that I'm going to to work with I'll open them up easy enough and I'm going to color my stenciled image with glaze I do love that I love having just a variety of colors. So I've got the colors that I want to use kind of over here, over here, and the colors that I want to use over here, over here. Okay. So because I'm going to do some stenciling, just grab a piece of grip real quick. All right. That'll work. Just going to place down a bit of media grip. That's going to grip uh, the paper and the stencil. I still hold on to stuff, but you know, if you want to tape things, you can tape things, but I'm just going to, I'm going to go for it. I have a domed foam that I have just dedicated to embossing ink. So I'm just going to take a blending tool, just going with embossing ink, place this down. Um, I think I like it there. And I'm just going to start pouncing through here. I'm not rubbing in a circular motion. I'm just pouncing the ink into those areas that I want some color. I don't, I don't necessarily care that the whole thing is covered on this one. So that's going to be good enough for me. Um, the grip just kind of, it just gave me grip. See, it doesn't, as long as you're, I mean, I hold my finger there anyway. So as long as you do that, that's the whole purpose of grip. The stencil, you can just wash off with water or baby wipe. It's water-based. So just throw that in some water. And then what we're going to do is we have our our inked backgrounds. I'm going to go back to my paper and I'm going to color with powders. So what I mean by that is I'm just going to take my finger. You can take a little spoon. You can take a, a straw, whatever it is that you want to use your fingers for and just pinch. Well, I said, use your fingers for, I meant instead of your fingers. Like some people just don't really like to touch things. I just think it's easier if you just grab onto it. If you have trouble seeing where your image is, because some people don't like to do this with clear, I like it because you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. But some people want to be a little bit more controlled. You could have done the inking with colors. There's nothing wrong because we know distress. 
uh, and oxide are also embossable. But all I'm doing is just taking a pinch and every time I go into a new color, I am wiping off my fingers just onto uh, that little towel I have off camera. And I'm just pinching and twisting my fingers. That's just applying some color uh, in different areas. This is what we have right now. Then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take my fingers and just, just do a little tap, a little dance. And you can see that image start to come into focus. Okay, just move it around. And that's what's getting the powder to kind of bounce around into those areas. Then I can tap that off. So this is what we have. Because I was really haphazard with the ink, that's what's going to happen with the powder. If you're not sure, if you're like, oh, I wonder if I can get more on there. Well, try it, right? It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, you know, you can just put some more color on there and just see, mm, not much, but that's it. So what do you do with this? Well, it's a party mix. So if you have a, a jar of party mix, you can save it. That's nothing wrong with that. But as we know, uh, as makers, embossing powder pretty much it's like the everlasting gobstopper. Something about it, it's like you, you use a jar of powder and then you take it out and then when you go to put it back, it's more powder than what came out of the jar. Crazy. All right, I'm gonna go back onto um, the, the grip. Now, again, for embossing, I'm just gonna hold this up and heat emboss. I'm gonna do this from the top just so you guys can see it melt. And you can see what's happening is that the colors of glaze, because I use so many different colors, it's also going to give that stenciled image a little bit more flair. Could you have just done this with one color? Absolutely, you could have. You could have just taken blue and just dumped it. Don't, don't think that you have to do all these fancy things. I just think for a demo, I want to show you all the things you can do. That's important. There's many things that you can do with it. But this could have just been done with a single color. It could have been a matching color and you could have poured it over that area. Notice when I'm embossing, I pretty much stay in the same spot and I just turn my paper. Uh, that will just, that's how I can keep from, well one, burning myself, but also it allows me to shift the paper into the light just to see the shine, because that's how you know if it's done. Oh, a little bit over here, still not done. I see that over there. There we go, okay. So here's what we've got. We've got this wonderful glazed background, but what I also like is that the pattern just kind of evolves from the color that it's around. And you could do this with many, many stencils. So we could put another stencil down. You can do some more pattern. You could just keep going and going with this. But here's what I wanted to share with you um, about the glaze itself. I'm just gonna cap these up. Okay, there you go. Uh, the heat tool I got, I got from Simon Says Stamp. Someone asked about the heat tool. It's a uh, Wagner. It's really good. It has two speeds. So it also has a low. So see, it's still as hot, but it's just a lower fan speed and then a higher fan speed, which just cooks it even faster. But um, I like the low speed if I'm ever embossing on vellum or if I'm embossing on, you know, if I try to emboss on Yupo or Duralar or something that it's heat stable, but it's a little, it's a little tricky, then I definitely use uh, a lower speed. Okay, let me just get this out of the way. That's just gonna pick that up. Uh, take my paper. There we go. Just so I don't have to work in that. Okay. So what we're going, oh. Now I had that slipper, it all jumps around, huh? Okay. So what I'm going to do on this is now I'm going to ink it. Cause one of the great things about this, the purpose of the grip is just to grip onto the paper. If you don't care, you can, you could have done everything right there on the mat, but I, I like the grip. I do. I like the grip for a couple things. I like that it grips. And I also like the fact that it, it holds on to anything I want it to hold on to, and it's going to be heat stable. So I'm just going to take some ink and I'm just going to start inking around that stenciled area. Just using a blending tool. I'm not going over the whole thing, just wherever I can see that I have some glaze because it also creates a, a great resist because that glaze just sealed the background and you maybe didn't notice the contrast at first, but you certainly will now that we've got uh, some brown on there. See that? But now we're gonna go in, add some water. There we go. Just doing some drippage because I think that's gonna be interesting. And now I'll switch back to this because I 
just want to dry some of those drops you can dry it completely you can do some some editing some dabbing dabbing is what's going to give you the bright dots if you dry the water drips on there it'll leave most of the color there as well it'll just give it uh, a background and to me i like the idea of the water because it also breaks up just the smoothness and we can always go back and add more so you can so let's just say that top area you wanted that to be lighter maybe it was just too brown a little bit of water a little dabbing look at that just edit that brighten that space up super super easy but this just creates a nice background the other nice thing about the heat tool now because remember we have embossing glaze could this heat tool heat this up to where it was sticky again yes but it takes way more time that's why i like to dry my ink with this because my glaze did not remelt it would take a lot longer for this heat tool to remelt the glaze so that's the other reason why i switch tools on that but great background right cool effect but again not only do you see the stamped image through there but it just intensifies that background almost adds uh, kind of a magnifying layer to it and that's where i wanted to show you just on this stencil so now that you kind of get the idea this is how this one was done so the negative that was the white space of the design because this was actually done with a mono print this was the the stenciled part sprayed and then this was the print so my my stenciled area was open and my background was colored I decided to go in and fill in my image with colors of glaze. So here you can see seedless preserves, then mixed in with a little bit of tattered rose, a little kitsch flamingo, and then it went into some crushed olive, a little bit of peeled paint, and then over here is some pumice stone. So I try to mimic my inky background with the glaze colors, but I love how you can see the writing through it, and it just creates a cool effect. It's pretty neat to, to do that as an all over pattern as well. A fun way to work with glaze. Okay, let's talk about some other things that we can do with glaze. Glaze for days. We could use glaze um, on textures. So let me get this out of the way. Textures are really important because if you are into mixed media or you do anything mixed media, you probably have a lot of them, okay? You probably have uh, a whole bunch of them. I do. So these would be, uh, whether it's texture paste, crackle paste, grip paste, paints, collage medium, any kind of uh, texture stuff, all of these, because they have moisture, they are all glazable and or embossable, meaning you could put powder on them and they all give you uh, different looks. There's a video entirely on mediums and paste if you wanna learn more about the properties of each one. Uh, I talk specifically about you know what each one does and, and how you can use them and how you can color them and all that but today it's about glazing so i did a little swatch just to show how each one of these pace or mediums holds glaze or works with glaze so the first one is just opaque texture paste so this is the one that's fluffy that's inkable so i put the paste through a stencil and while the paste is wet we applied glaze and we let the paste dry. That is the important thing to remember about any of these is that you have to apply the glaze itself, the powder, while the medium is wet, but you have to let the medium dry before you emboss it. If you don't, the medium itself, the paste will actually bubble and blister, which is also very cool if you're going for, you know, kind of a, a grungy cauldrony effect. But if you want the paste to remain the same texture, just glazed you need to let it dry and that only takes maybe 15 20 minutes just depends on how thick you apply the paste or again your climate so once it's dry you don't want to touch it because all the powder would come right off you just go in and heat emboss it and that's what melts the glaze to the texture so that gives you a really great thick use of glaze just by putting it right over the paste so that is going to be opaque then the next one is translucent you might Which be like, tin? Which tin is that? Did you oh, that? no, this is the distress. Uh, this is the distress pad tin. Sorry. I just, this is the same tin as this. I just took out the insert, just popped it out. Didn't need it. You could use the insert for another drawer or something, but it just fit these so well that I like, I like having my mediums, palette knives. I even have like these squeegees. I love these cause these are, um, a lot of people use different things to put paste on things. I'll put some paste on something. Um, but I picked these up uh, on Amazon. They were really inexpensive. I couldn't find anything like this in the craft market. I don't like plastic ones. You know, I don't like scratching through something. 
these all have that little rubber edge. I don't like using a gift card or credit card. So yeah, these are what people use, I think, to put <laughs> detailing on a car when they wrap a car. That's what these are for, tinting on a window. But yeah, so I, I use these for paste because see that squeegee just kind of bends a little bit better. I love these. Yeah, nobody, cool. nobody made them. I know it'd be great if someone made them, but they don't. So uh, texture paste translucent. So what that is, that's going to be the same paste that's clear that we can glaze. And you might think, okay, well, what's the difference between the two? Um, I wouldn't say there's much, to be honest, because the glaze is what's going to give you the shine. I will say that regular texture paste, opaque texture paste is a bit more chunky. So you, you know, you get more harsh ridges where this one ha tends to self level. So I think I got a much smoother glass like finish, if you will, by putting my embossing glaze over translucent texture paste. Okay, that's, I would say that's the only difference in that, but it does, it gives it a nice even coverage. Same rules apply, put it through there, put on your glaze, let it dry, heat it up. Okay, then we get into some cool stuff. And this one, this is something I learned from Stacy, uh, who is one of the makers. Stacy just, she did this technique, I don't even know how long ago, it was years ago. And when I saw it, I'm like, oh my gosh, I would have never thought of that. So shout out to Stacy. It's using crackle paste opaque, you apply the crackle paste, you put the glaze on again while the paste is wet, but when the paste dries, it also holds on to the glaze. And then when you heat it, you actually get crackled glaze. And what's beautiful about that is the effects are just, they're magic. Let me show you some of these. I like to keep a lot of different e examples. So this is, there you go. That's crackle paste and glaze. So the whole flower is done with glaze. The same way I did the stencil, just little pinches of color. Again, there is an entire uh, demo on this, but it's a, a fun way to remember, oh, hey, I could put the paste on and take it off and I could do one color. Oh yeah, remember Tim did the whole little pinchy pinchy? Yeah, same thing. You can use it on any paste, but take a look at that. Ooh wee, so good. So that's crackle paste opaque. Then we have crackle paste translucent. This one's a little bit different because I don't think you, you don't get the same effect as you do opaque. And that's because the crack of this one is a little bit more fractured, if you will, not tiny cracks. So I didn't really notice any crackle at all when the glaze uh, hit it. I think that the glaze maybe filled in these small little lines that you see, whereas the opaque one is a bit chunkier. I still like it because when the light hits it, you can see that there's lines through it. It is, it doesn't have that smooth finish, but it's not nearly as crackly as this, but I still liked it. And I'm glad I did it because uh, it just reminds me like, oh, I could still do some in some areas to maybe uh, get a little bit more of a worn look. And then we have grit paste. So grit paste is really interesting because it is gritty and it's very chunky, which means when you add glaze to it, your glaze becomes very chunky. And what I mean by that is instead of regular texture paste, let's go back to our swatch where it just created glaze with texture. This one is way more pitted. You see the difference? it's way more pitted because grit paste is gritty and it has those pits. I like this because if you're going for the chunkiest type of glaze, you know, cause we used to have like just different thicknesses of powder. This is going to give you a very raised enamel look, but also super, super chunky because it's only going to mimic its texture you apply it to. That's what's so fun about the glaze. We're mimicking uh, the texture that's there. Then we also have, translucent grit paste. Probably one of my favorite demos that I've done. I think this was done maybe uh, last year sometime, but I wanted to glaze translucent. And what it does to me is it looks like glass. Uh, I think I even kept one. See, this is like one background I never even touched. Look at that. That is distress embossing glaze over translucent grit paste. So you can see how dimensional and it really does just look so glass like. And the reason it's got these colors, same thing. I mimicked it with my colors of glaze. So I did a little rusty hinge, you know, you just can mimic your distress colors in glaze. That's why in hopefully we will at some point have all the colors of glaze because I love being able to match it up because it's like, whoa, that's so cool. And you might think, well, couldn't I just do this with clear embossing? Yes, but you will not get these intense colors. We saw that at the very beginning when we talked about just using glaze over ink versus just glaze over uh, your clear 
over ink versus glaze over ink. You just get a more intense coloration of that. So I do love that because look at that, look at that texture. So you still get uh, the grittiness of this. This one is just translucent and I love how it bubbles. And then of course the last medium is collage medium because collage medium is, it's a gel medium. It's a glue. It has a very fast drying time, but it's one of my favorites for glazing. And I'll tell you why, for those that asked about glazing other things like metal, glass, and plastic. So this is collage medium. Believe it or not, there is collage medium on this side, uh, but collage medium because it's matte, well, it's actually doing its thing. So yay for that because you don't see it, but it is there. I don't know if I could even, I don't even know if you can see it. It's there, but it dries matte. So you're not supposed to see it, which is great, but it is a perfect ad adhering uh, medium to put glaze on other substrates. So could you use it on paper? Yes, but I wouldn't use collage medium on paper when I have inks. So this is where we're going to move on to the next part. Let's do, I'm going to actually, let's do something. Let's do a little crackle. That's always fun uh, to do. Let's do that. And we'll do translucent grit paste. Both are my favorites. And we'll take a little palette knife and I got a couple of squeegees. Okay. Everyone doing okay? Doing great. Okay. 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 Let's move okay. this. Okay. 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 We're good. Let's do, <laughs> let's do a little bit of this. I'm going to just put this back down. I'll take a background. Well, I'll take a background that I've already done. We'll do this one. This one will be pretty. That one will crackle. Just do, Ooh, I know what I'll, I'm going to do. Okay. I'm going to do this with this and I'm going to do this with this. I had to think about that in my head for just a moment. And that one is going to go over just picking out some backgrounds, guys. That one's going to go over that. Okay. So you just had to, if you do, if you just answer all your questions ahead of time, then you're good to go. But I don't really want to use that one. So see, and there's nothing wrong with changing your mind. That's a better one. Look, it had to, just, this wouldn't allow me to play with many colors. This one, this one will, because we're going to do translucent grit. So for this, Take a look at, at what you have here. Okay, so it's like, okay, I've got colors. I've got purples, I've got some green, I've got some blues. So let's just utilize that. Let's take a couple of colors. There's a, there's a lot of purples, there's wilted violet, but of course now that we have seedless preserves, we're gonna do a little seedless preserves as well. Think over here in the green, definitely wanna do a little crushed olive because that's gonna be my jam. Do a little bit, I want Mermaid Lagoon because that's a new one. And I also want a little bit of brown for over here and probably one other color of green. Let's just do a little bit of peeled paint. So I don't know if you can see in my, my hot mess what we have, but I'm just going to take just some kind of matchy matchy colors just with this one. So let's get them ready. Do purple just to have them at the ready. There's my brown. And I, I give them a thunk before I open just because, yeah. I agree, Ted. I think that when you start using your paste with glaze, it just, it, it just kind of goes into uh, thicker embossing powders. It also, because if you understand the properties of your mediums, that's why, you know, even that swatch is really good. If you understand the texture it's going to give, that texture is replicated with your glaze. So that is going to be replicated in the glaze. That is, that is, that is, and even down to our grit. So when you understand that it does, it gives, you know, you already think like, oh my gosh, I can use grit with, with water and ink and oxide and all those things. Yep. But you can also now use it with paste if you, if you didn't think about that. Okay. So I'm going to open this up. I do have press and seal uh, around all of my mediums. I do live in Arizona. It is hot, 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 especially in the summer. And that just always goes right onto the level of the medium, which is what's going to keep it from drying up. If you find that your mediums are getting a little dry, you can add a little water to them. If you're maintaining it that way, don't flood it with water, but you can't resurrect it. Meaning once it's dried up, you can't add any water to it. So um, I do like to keep mine a little bit more fluid because they tend to dry up pretty quick. Okay. So this is translucent grit paste. Uh, I'm just working on the grip just to just to give me a little, little extra grip. I'm not going to put this everywhere. Okay. So this one, you can see I have it off camera. I just wanted to put some of these dots just in different places because it's grit. I'm also kind of embracing its 
chunkiness, I guess. It's grittiness. Um, so I'm not, this one I don't necessarily want smooth. So that's why I like a tiny little palette knife just to create that effect. Okay, so again, that goes in water. Palette knife can just get wiped off while the stuff is wet. And then the press and seal, just press and seal. There you go. <laughs> and then your lid can go, still screw right over the top of it. Okay, here's what we've got. So that's our grit paste right now. So see how, see when I said I'm like letting it be gritty, meaning you didn't see me continue to go over the top of it and you didn't see me uh, squeegee it either. I didn't want to use a scraper or squeegee for that one because I want to keep the texture of this. So now we'll go in with our glaze and I'm just going to do this really quick because I've already talked about what I'm doing and how I'm doing, but now you can just uh, watch really how fast it does. It does go. It doesn't take much time at all. If you just don't overthink it, thinking is so overrated in this. It really is because uh, I think just the more haphazard you are with with your color choices, especially if you're just following uh, your eye and what you're seeing in the background, the happier you'll be with the result. I believe that, I do. I think it's just gonna surprise you. And you don't need a lot of powder for this because I know you're creating a party mix and some people might think, oh, that's pretty wasteful. Um, it probably is if you're not using the party mix. I don't use the party mix, but then again, you know, I'm not a dump truck when I'm adding the stuff to the background. I'm just, I'm using just a pinch of it. It's probably more on the, the table that we, that we throw away than anything else. I'm gonna go with a little bit more seedless up here, bring in a little bit more of that color into that. Okay. And a little bit more broken china into that. Okay. Once you're happy with that, there we go. We're just gonna do the tap. Okay. And all that's really doing is just kind of creating a vibration to get that powder uh, to jump around what it's next to. Meaning if I picked up this paper and just dumped it like normal, whatever color you had more of would pretty much dominate anything as it's falling off. And we don't want to because we kind of put the colors where we wanted it, right? So that little bouncy to bounce is what's going to uh, get the color, see, just where we need it to be. And then once you feel that your design is covered, well, then you can tap off the rest. But look at that, easy enough. Perfect. And we're going to let this dry because we need it to dry and we'll heat emboss it. So I'll set this off in front of me so I remember to do it. And then we'll go. Uh, I have a fan behind me that's blowing. So now I have like, right yeah. oh, I, I don't mind. Yeah, that's why I was like, I didn't really feel it until just then. And then it just kind of took that's because Mario was standing there. But that's all right. I don't mind that. Okay, I'm going to quickly put the lid on this. Nothing a little Swiffer can do. Okay. Okay, yeah, the, the tap is, is super important. And, and honestly, just having colors of glaze, I think a lot of times people, because they because it is an embossing powder, that is true. And I understand the confusion, so I'm, I'm not downplaying that at all. But as with any medium, if you understand its properties, it opens up a whole different level of possibilities as makers of what we can do with it, right? Because I think so many times we just look at something online or, and we're like, oh yeah, embossing powders, I don't really use it, I have it. To me, glaze is an art medium. It's, ju it's just as important as a, a crackle paste or a gel medium or anything else because it has a colorant to it. So it, that has that property like an ink or a spray, but it also is going to uh, allow me to utilize it with so many different things, using it with, with glues, using it with all of that. And I'm gonna still talk about gluing and metals and resin and all that. Don't worry, I will get to it. But we got we to gotta do the process. Okay, so for this next one, we're going to do a, a, just a quick run of Crackle. This is just a background. This was craft paper. Remember, we did this with distress paint. This was fun. That was a distress paint background in Brayer. And that's the importance of remembering to play uh, with your other mediums, create backgrounds. So then when you're into glaze and paste, you don't have to do what we did at the beginning of the demo, which is create a background. I always just like to do that because if I don't have any inks in play, it gets a little weird. This one, crackle paste opaque. Each texture you're also gonna notice has its own characteristics. Some are thick, some are fluffy, some are wetter. Uh, they're just weird and everybody has a preference. I, be honest, I like my mediums to be a little bit on the, I don't know, the gummier side, the, the thicker side versus fluid, but that's just me. Okay, for this one, we're gonna do some skulls and I'm just going for grunge. So let's do, I don't think I want to do 
There we go. I'll do a little weathered wood. Then we'll do a little pumice stone and the color that I didn't take out of the tin, I'm sure. Oh, no, I, I guess I did. I don't see it. I don't see it. If I don't see it, I don't need it. Oh, but I found it, so I'm using it. Lost Shadows. So we're going to just go with some grunge. This is going to be pumice stone. That's what I said. It's that new, yummy, dingier color. Lost Shadow. Beautiful soft gray. And a little weathered wood, which is kind of a, a bluish gray. Let me keep this down until I'm ready. Less talky, more dewy. Because see, even the stuff on the lid? <laughs> crackle paste doesn't take long to crackle. Okay. Here we go. We're going to take this off. There we go. Just my colors. And I'm not going to do much. I'm going to do a little bit of color and then I'm probably going to dump uh, pumice over, over most of it. Okay. So what I'll do for this one, because I want to have a pretty good uh, crackle finish, let's take some of this paste. And I think for this one, I am going to tape it down just because a little bit of masking tape just to help. I don't know if it's going to stick onto the grip. It's going to stick enough. Okay. There we go. A little bit of that, a little bit of that, a little bit of that. Press and seal. And then I'm just going to take this and squeegee it. I also like that this is a manageable size, but see, because of that rubber, that little rubbery and it's just to me it doesn't dig it out that's what i like pretty cool see how much easier it is i think it's way easier and this is just so i can also like i'll show you i can also pick some of that up but now i can take this um take it off with my palette knife and just put it back into the jar so nice convenient throwing that in water uh, get that little frosting off here we go i always catch my finger don't i tell you it's that finger that doesn't want to go to the party Throwing that in the water as well. <laughs> there we go. Put that on. I still have to throw that stencil in the water too. So, yeah, but crackle paste, perfect. Gonna take that off. Oh yeah, excellent. I'll throw the tape in the water too. There you go. <laughs> it's a party. Okay, now I'm gonna just do a little bit of tinting with this, but this is what I was saying about the squeegee, right? See how I can like, I can get some smooth areas, but I don't know. It goes on really, it's just different than um, plastic. I've never been successful with those plastic scrapers. And I even tried like just a full on silicone one, but then it was too, uh, too bouncy. Okay. I'm just sprinkling some colors on this one. This I'm creating, I am creating the party mix. So see, sometimes a party mix uh, is good because I'm not being so particular with color this time because I want these skulls to all have like those blue gray, um, you know, pumicey tone. So a lot of times if you like to do uh, certain effects, maybe you like to do uh, rust or grunge or I don't know, any kind, this, this one's a little bit more industrial. You can save or make certain party mix colors. I think that's going to be, um, I want to add definitely some more gray blue of weathered wood, but I got to say pumice is my jam. Pumice and, and frayed burlap would also be another good one. So I'm going to take that. I'm also going to pick up my paper. Take that little party mix. Pour the party mix back onto this. See, because it's just something cool. And then we'll just, just kind of do the dance everywhere just to see that fan. It's like I'm Beyonce over here. I like this. No, 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 it's fine. It's good. There we go. All right, so now we got this great mix. We're also going to let this dry and crackle. Okay, moving on. There we are. Let's cover this, cover this. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I just saw someone said that's, uh, oh, it was Mel. That's it. I'm looking for that squeegee. I tell you, you can ask Mario. I tried so many things. I'm like, I even went, you know, to the art store where you find those really high-end art tools, you know, because they're supposed to give you flexibility and rigidity and this. And I'm like, yeah, no. And then there were those big scrapers and I'm like, that didn't work either. Um, yeah. And I'm like, I just need something that's like the size of a gift card because, but a gift card again is too scratchy. 
And then it was this and it, yeah, the picture shows like somebody, I think putting decals on a car, tinting windows. I'm like, Oh, oh, that's really, I that's what it was. That's what it's for. Yes. The guys who do the windows. That's what it is. But they're inexpensive. I, before, I yeah. think it was like six of them. And I don't know. I think all six of them were like under 10 bucks. That's why I'm like, it'd be really nice if somebody made those, but that's, exactly right. that's, that's too much convincing. So I'm over that. <laughs> okay, we're letting those dry right now, and let's talk about collage medium, okay? Because collage medium is going to get us into our next, our next little area, okay? So put that over there, put that over there. Grit translucent goes here, that goes there, that goes there, and see, yeah, then I can just put all of those in there. Okay, collage medium. I have a jar already out that's already almost gone, so... Here's the thing about collage medium. Collage medium is what's going to allow you to glaze things other than paper. That would, I use collage medium if I'm going to glaze wood, if I'm going to glaze metal, or if I'm going to glaze glass or plastic. Now the thing to remember when I talk about plastic is essentially you can use glaze on anything that's heat stable, okay? If you can't heat it, you can't glaze it because how are you going to melt the glaze? Because you'd be like, but you said we could do it on plastic. Sure. But that plastic that you're glazing needs to be heat tolerant, like a Duralar. And even then, because you have to put so much heat to melt this, you have to be aware that you can maybe heat that surface for a little bit, let it cool for a second, heat it. Because the other thing to know about embossing powder or glaze, it's not a one shot wonder, meaning you don't have to heat it the entire time to completion. Um, which is how most people melt a surface like that. You can heat it a little bit, give it a second for the surface to cool, heat it again, give it a second, and it will actually melt and emboss without burning your surface. So if you find that maybe you're embossing vellum or maybe you're trying to emboss on, I don't know, like Yupo, and you find that you're always um, melting that surface, try just embossing, stop for a second, because that lets the surface cool a little bit, emboss, your powder will still melt. It's not like, oh, if my powder cools in this weird state, it won't keep melting. It will keep melting every time you add heat. But collage medium allows us to take things like trinkety bits, charms. I did this one in a, a demo a while ago, and you can add glaze to those metal charms. Mario kept this make actually. Uh, these are just taking uh, different ideology charms and glazing them, and I'll show you how to do it. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but it not only gives that metal color, because you might be like, well, can I just alcohol ink it? Sure, but it won't look like this. It won't be shiny and glazed. It will just be colored. So the beauty of glaze is that you're able to add a color uh, and a little bit of shine to it. I like to work with craft sticks to hold on to the metal object. You can use hot glue to glue that element to it, or you can do any type of heat stable tape uh, like Wonder Tape or Bologna Tape, whatever you want to call it. Uh, just depends on what this is. Because this is flat, I'm going to use tape, uh, but I'll show you another element that if you're using it, you might want to hot glue it. Either way, uh, that thing that's sticking it to the stick is not going to make it foolproof. Meaning, like, you see the hot glue there? It, when you're embossing, you could also cool the, the embossing. I need to find a clean area of the stick. There we go. So I'm going to put a little bit of that uh, tape on there. I'm going to peel off that edge. Okay, and then I'm just going to fold this back onto itself. So I just have like a really industrial uh, glue boogie. There we go. And I'm going to stick this down. There we go. So now I have something that I can hold on to, uh, not only while I'm adding glue and glaze, but also to emboss it. Now, could you just do this right, ooh, right here on the craft mat? Yeah, you can. But I find it easier to just be able to hold on to this and do it. Okay. Little flat brush for glue. And pick your glaze color. In this case, I think let's do something um new i want to do we can i think we'll do a little bit of peacock feathers you can mix it you definitely can mix and match it uh, but i'll do or maybe no let's do some pink we'll do abandoned coral let's do that okay so what i'm going to do is take this uh take a little bit of get a paper okay so I've got my glaze that I'm going to use. 
collage medium that's going to be my glue and you can see my collage medium is down to the end i don't i don't have to use uh, press and seal on my collage medium because i use it so fast that i don't have to worry about it um, but if you don't get to your mediums often you might want to use it on that too okay so what we're going to do is we're just going to take this and we're going to paint so if you were doing this on a glass bottle or jar you would do the same thing you're going to paint a layer of collage medium because this is a glue that is designed for metals. So you can't just use like school glue or glue stick. You have to use an adhesive that's designed for the substrate you're putting the glaze on. And collage medium works on every substrate. Metal, glass, plastic, resin. So I'm just brushing it. You see I'm brushing it over and over again because I don't want a thick layer because that's going to create uh, chunky bubbles. But I want to make sure that I've got collage medium wherever uh, I want that glaze to be. And collage medium has a pretty fast drying time. So once you're done, take that and just cover it with glaze. Could you do the, the little pinch and tint? Absolutely, you do you. But that's all you need. I'm gonna let that sit there for a second. This, if you're going to do more pieces, wrap this in a baby wipe instead of putting it in water. If you're gonna glue many pieces, the baby wipe will keep it uh, damp enough. I'm just gonna use a paper towel, which is easy. You can also just take, if you don't have baby wipes, just take a paper towel, add some water to it just so it's damp. And if you wrap, this works with glue or paint or anything, but that's just gonna keep that medium wet on your brush without your brush becoming wet. Because if you, if you get your brush too wet, it's not good. Okay, now I want that glaze to really stick to uh, the glue. So often I'll just take another piece of paper and just tap that glaze down. You could use your hand, but then it's just gonna stick to your hand. Aw, sad face. It's not really sad. Okay, it's gone. So, that just kind of makes sure that the glaze is stuck on there. There we are. Then I'm gonna tap that off. And you can be fairly aggressive with this. You can just look to see that your glaze is on your metal. Now we're gonna put this back in the jar. Because collage medium has a drying time of now, you don't have to wait. You could, because it's just drying, but you could also just go in and just go for it. You could emboss it right away which I think is what I'll do because I want to move on to the next one. Now, let's talk about embossing metal. When we emboss metal, embossing has a melting temp of usually about 320 to 340 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So in order for this powder to melt, its surface has to get that hot. Paper doesn't really conduct heat, so that's why we can emboss uh, cardstock no problem. But when it comes to metal, metal is going to get hot, so you can't hold on to that. Um, you may want to try you know, a gripper or tweezers, but whatever you're grabbing is going to impact your glaze. That's why I prefer just to stick it on something that doesn't conduct heat, like wood, and then we're going to heat it up. Now, the other thing to note is that when we heat this, if this was done with hot glue, if this was glued onto the stick with hot glue, you could remelt the hot glue and your element could fall off. So don't be too high in the air, just maybe be a little closer, but it's gonna take a little bit longer to emboss because you have to make sure that this gets hot. But once it does get hot, it embosses like zippity-doo. So that's really, really good. So see, it's already starting to melt. And I'll show you. I'll kind of do half on one side. There we go. See, look at that. It's already going. All right. Mm-hmm. And the other beautiful thing about doing metal is that you can't over emboss it. So you can really get this liquid. Like, I don't know if you can see, it's like bubbling. Um, because I want it to be so fluid that it does get into all those little cracks and grooves. So I don't mind heating it a little bit longer because unlike paper, metal is non-porous. So no matter how hot this stuff gets, it can't absorb into the metal. Okay. So this is our finished result. I mean, look at that. It's, it's like a glass enameled, beautiful thing. But, so but because it's glaze, I love it, don't you? Because it's glaze and it's translucent, we're still seeing the metallic property of the charm. Because you might think, well, wait a minute, couldn't I just do alcohol ink and then this? Yes, but it's not gonna give you this translucent colorant because that is what we put over the top of it. And because it started out as a silver charm, that silver metallic is going to come through. Now, you could add color. I mean, I love, these are, these are all done with glaze. Those are just the bugs. You could just do it to one spot. So like I have, and again, I, <laughs> I like to sit around and just do stuff. 
I don't ever have any intention of like, oh, I'm going to make this with this. So, you know, maybe one day you just want to get out your charms and glaze. So here I've got all these little insects with just a little bit of glaze on them ready to go. That's fun. Or maybe you want to take your leaves. These are all ideology. And maybe you want to just add some different colors and have some glazed leaves at the ready. I talk about this all the time. Compartmental making is so important because often if you were sitting there making something, you're not going to do an inky background and then get the paste and then do the glaze and then go in and do the stamping and then go ahead and glaze the embellishment because that one card will take you a week. But if you have these elements at the ready, you might spend a couple hours just glazing charms. You might spend uh, a day just doing some backgrounds, but then you have all these elements to just grab and go. So I do love that about compartmental making. So cooling this off, um, it doesn't take very long to cool. Just gonna go ahead and kind of twist this, give it a little, you'll know if you touch it and it's too hot, don't touch it. Just, you know, that's it. But if it's, if it's not too hot for you, you can just pull that off. Another quick way to cool this down because it was still a little bit warm, water, okay? Remember we put on plastic, just what we learned at the very beginning. So plastic's waterproof. So that water, it just cooled this down immediately and take a look at that. Yeah. So cool. Amazing. I love those. Yeah. And then you're ready to go. You're ready to go and, and create some elements. And to be honest, this, this demo, that, and I've done this, uh, as I mentioned uh, with these butterflies, I've done this so many, so many times. But the cool thing about this is that sometimes a technique inspires a whole new idea. And that's what happened uh, with this. So you have to forgive me because I don't really know what year stuff comes out, but you know, I always think that it just came out, but it could have been years. And then if I say it was years, it just came out. So um, we released a product called Foundry Wax. I want to say it's last year, but I could be wrong. But this is a fluid wax that you heat and it creates really amazing effects because it is a metallic wax that could be rubbed over paper. There's a whole video on Foundry Wax, okay? But Foundry Wax can turn an element, anything, this happens to be a resin skull, into something that is metallic. These are plastic bones. Because this has um, leafing metals into it, and once it gets hot, the leafing metals actually become solid. And so I was super inspired by this technique, and I'm like, hmm, I wonder if I could glaze foundry wax. So there we go. So here's what we did, okay? So here's just an example of a skull. So this is one of the ideology skulls we do for Halloween. That's how it comes, that, that's its finish. So I'm like, what does the new seedless preserves look like on this skull? Okay, and again, we know how it's done. How do we get the glaze to stick? Collage medium, why? Because it's resin, so that's glazed. So that is just a seedless preserve glazed skull. Looks pretty cool. This one is done with foundry wax. After the foundry wax is done, I'm like, I wonder if I could put collage medium over something that's been foundry waxed and glaze it and take a look at that it is such a different vibe because now you have come on i haven't heard that in a while um so now we have a metallic just like as if it were a metal charm metallic glazed element so that would be so we're not mixing it with the foundry wax you're just doing the foundry wax i happen to use sterling so you would foundry wax it like normal let it cool do your thing but then you could go in add collage medium, add a glaze, and you could glaze over because the foundry wax will not remelt. Okay, it's already set. But I love that because it does give me the opportunity now to create enameled metallic things by just adding a step. So you have something and something glazed, ah, oh, it's okay because it's translucent. So it's picking up a lot of that brown. Yeah, you could paint this white and it would be brighter, but in order for it to be metallic, could you use metallic paint? Possibly, but the metallic paint would need to be as reflective as metal, which foundry wax is. Most metallic paints aren't, they're silvery, but they're not as reflective because the light needs to still come back through that glaze. But I love how that turned out. So cool. So see, again, one technique inspires, uh, oh, wouldn't that be cool if we could do this? I wonder. And then I'm doing it. And I, I love that. So that was just a fun way to to show how you can utilize something. And did it have to be silver? No, knowing what we know from the very beginning of the demo, we could glaze something that's done in gold, something that's done in, in bronze or anything. It just depends on what color glaze because it's going to impact, uh, be impacted by your base color. But quite cool. 
So that's how you do metal and resins and wax. Just wanted to share uh, those elements. Okay, let's go back to these. Let's see how we're doing here. Uh, still working. I'm going to let that sit a little bit longer and we'll go ahead and jump into something else and then I'll heat that up. Okay, something else that I really liked and uh, I think it's important to always remember of the things that we have. We talked about embossing powders. Um, if you have any impresslets, uh, Sizzix no longer makes these impresslets. They're still on the market. If you, Some stores still have them, uh, but my full line of impresslets with Sizzix has all been retired. But these are great because this is an embossing folder that not only uh, embosses, but it also cuts something out. So it creates all these cool uh, embellishments, which is good. <laughs> hey, I don't mind, Tracy, if you're late, too busy selling, that's good. Yeah, we can all relate. So the whole thing about having paper embellishments and glaze is that you can create things. And I did these kind of quick cards uh, earlier. Mm, see, again, I'm talking about time. I'm going to say a month ago. But it was about taking my backgrounds or taking things that I did and making quick cards. So often I'll sit and just do a lot of impressives. This is watercolor cardstock, but it could be any paper that you like to work with. So you have a bag of those. And then some days I just like to glaze them. So these are... These are all glazed pieces. And I love, you know, taking backgrounds. This is the eroded metallic distress paint, run through an impresslet and then glazed. So now not only do I get the metal, but I get the grunge and I get that cool glaze shine in there. I like to do colored elements. So this is the same frame, but how great is that when you add color? So much fun. You can just do so many different things with uh, I love the new mode lawn. Look how great that is for a clover. This one I think was done with when I put them on cards. Yeah, this was peeled paint. Also a great green, probably my favorite green, peeled paint. But I do like uh, the new mowed lawn when you're when you're grunging it up. Honestly, that is just so hard to believe. It's just paper. Yeah, it's just white paper. Changes into a glazed charm. So you can do a lot of different things. I love the heart. This is Lucky Love. These both come in the same folder. But it, it's quite easy to do. So there are many ways that we can approach this. So all the coloring done on these pieces, with the exception of this eroded metallic one, which I explained was a previous background, but all these started out like this and their color is just glaze and a brown crayon. So let's do one of those. I've done these many times and I never tire of it. So I say we do it. And I think I'll do a heart. I don't mind that. I do. This one was done with wood grain thought that was really interesting just to see if I could get some of that wood grain. Uh, and it did. I like it. I like how that worked. Um, but yeah, let's do a heart, shall we? Small enough. We could do it. Okay. So what I'm going to use for this one, because I'm wanting to put ink in a specific area, is we're going to use an embossing pen, possibly, if I can find it. Yep, I can. And I found the wrong one. It's here. Somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, I shipped it like coin dozer. Here it is. Because the embossing pens come in bullet and brush. And if I'm going to color, I'm going to use a brush tip. I do love these though, because look, that's a e quick card. A little swipe of paint. That's a paint swatch I did. That's, that was all just repurposing stuff that I did. Look at that butterfly on the card. That's the same one, right? You have a, you have a bucket of them, then it makes a quick card. Boom, tag background, that, that. Okay. So what we can do on these is uh, take our brush pen and add color. And again, whatever paper, this one's watercolor, this one's heavy stock. They're both going to work. It doesn't really matter. I'll go for this one because I want a little bit more texture. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Let's take a little abandoned coral. I think that's going to make uh, a nice heart. And we'll also mix this. There we go. Ah, yes, Julie just called out the whole video. You're right, Julie, and, and thanks for Julie's help getting them all timestamped. And I'll talk about that at the end, but we have playlists on YouTube where you can find things so much easier now. Uh, timestamps, again, so much easier now, thanks to, to Julie's help, and then the, the index for everything organization for Zoe and Neil. Okay, I'm going to use antique linen as well. Told you, by the time we're done with this, I'm going to have every single color out of that, that tin that we started with. So this, again, is the same ink that we have in the dabber and the pad. So it goes really quick. We're just going to take this. We're going to color this. If you have great handwriting, you can just do your handwriting. I'm just going to color all the way around. It is a clear ink. 
I'm going to scribble it on. Could you use a dabber? Yes. Could you use a paintbrush and your ink pad? Yes. Could you use a paintbrush and your pad? Yes. A paintbrush and a reinker? Yes. Or could you use a pen and make it all easier and not overload it? Yes. So that's what we've done. Next, we'll take some glaze, pinch some color on that. I just like to mix my glazes if you haven't noticed already. I just, I love it because they're translucent that even these colors together are just going to mix really, really nice. Okay. So now I'll pick this up and get another little scooper. I'm going to just pick this up with a piece of paper and just add it to that little area right there. I don't know if you guys saw that. It's kind of in the corner. But yeah, if you miss a spot, I can just grab that same kind of party mix and fill in the blanks. Okay, there we go. So anything that you don't want, if you don't like something, you can always go in with a brush and edit. So if you don't like that there's glaze right there and it's still dry, you can just take a brush and you can flick that off. So don't ever think that, you know, you have to be super careful and mask. You can just brush it off and get rid of it. Same thing, if you don't like that that's not covered, we can now go in with a pen. And as long as you don't, I mean, if you, if you touch the dry powder, you're just going to lift it. You're not going to ruin your pen. You just have to wipe it off. Okay. But we can just go into those little areas. Sorry, it's off camera so I can see. Uh, but just add a little bit of that embossing pen. I'm going to add a little bit brighter pink over here. And you can fill in the blank. So easy, easy. Now, if you're going to use two colors, which I am, that's why I'm demoing this. We don't want to put two colors on simultaneously. I don't. To me, that's just way too much work. So I'm going to add, I'm going to just grip on the edges just with that. Those little silicone fingers will hold on to that. And I'm going to emboss it. Okay. And before I do, I actually want this to be a little bit weathered. I want to show you how I did that weathered heart. So to create a weathered spot, you can just go in with your fingers right now and just lightly, before you heat it, just lightly touch it. See that? See those little weathered areas? Wherever you reveal the, the space of your cardstock, that's going to be helpful at, at, for a, a weathered effect in a second. Okay, there we go. Now let's melt it. Cool. Nice. Ooh, yeah. Okay. Done. So there's our first glaze layer. So you see what I mean by that little white area is still left unglazed. Perfect. Now we'll go in and we'll do uh, the antique linen just as that color. So there we are. Okay. Now cooling time on paper literally is seconds. So I think that that's, that's a thing to remember. It's not like metal paper. Your paper should cool in seconds. If not, you are, you are overheating it. Okay. Let's take our pen. I'm just going to quickly cover the outside outside. I don't want to, you could go in with a dabber if you wanted it to really fill in the blanks, but I want to hit the high points of this one. So again, just going around. Perfect. And because I'm going to put this all back in. Good, 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 good. Okay. There we are. A little antique linen. Going to wipe some of this off too because I want it to also be distressed. I can put this back in the jar now or later. It doesn't really matter. Um, I know some people are really, they freak their freak about, oh, there's an open jar. Well, yeah, if you have your heat tool right next to the open jar, probably not your best creative move. But this one, I'm just going to hold on to one side because I need to angle this one. This one's a little bit more challenging for me to see. So that's why I put my powder away on this one because I've been there, done that. See, I like, I need to switch my hands and I'm able to touch that powder pretty much right away. It cools really quick. All right, one more spot over here. Okay, and then just for good measure, I'm just gonna go around. Okay, so now we have this embossed, perfect. Perfect. So you can see on this embossed heart, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of space, a lot of white space. That's what we're going to do. We're going to grunge it up. So I'm going to take a distressed crayon and a brush. 
and I'm going to just going to add some some grunge. So walnut stain is going to be my grunge of choice. A blending brush. I have one dedicated to a brown crayon, but you can use whatever tool you want to get the crayon in. Uh, but you want some type of brush or something just to kind of create a little bit of a little bit of grunge texture. So I'm just going to add some crayon. Now Distress Crayon is a water reactive pigment. The brush, this is just going to allow me to kind of move this and get it in all of those areas. If I, if I try to do this with my finger, I'll probably just smash this heart. So that's why you want a brush and you want a brush that's also rigid enough. So the nice thing about this is it lets me slide this. So if it's back, it's going to be kind of fluffy. But if I slide it forward and just rest my finger on that ring, it just becomes a more compact brush. And that's what's allowing me to push that medium and work that crayon into those areas. All right. So this is what I end up with right now. Pretty grungy, but we're not done. But I got that grunge on there. So here's the beauty of this technique. Because the crayons are a water reactive pigment, water is now going to move the pigment. And because the glaze is plastic, our embossing glaze is plastic, it's going to actually seal this up. So what I'll do is just add a little bit of water to a paper towel just so I can get some water on my finger and just start lifting off some of that color. Now you can wipe this off with a cloth, but I just find that your finger is much more controlling because you can just figure out where you want to remove some color. And then I'll just, just go around the edge with this. Take a look at that. How great. So now that crayon, because it was water reactive, I was able to remove that crayon from that area. But wherever the glaze wasn't, remember when I rubbed this with my fingers, wherever the glaze wasn't, it left the paper exposed. And that's where the crayon is able to like sit in and create that pitted grungy look. And now you have an embellishment like zippity do for a heart. So this one, this had some foundry wax on it. So you see that little gilding around there? So then next step was a little foundry wax, rub that, heat that. You can take everything that you have and go again and again, but pretty phenomenal that, you know, something paper, you're able to make these. So yeah, if you, if you can get some impressives, I suggest getting them while you can, because they are when they're, and I think the butterfly has long been sold out for years, but when they're gone, they're, they're gone for good. But I love having some quick paper embellishments to use um, all the time. And it doesn't have to be embossed. It could just be a flat die cut. You could do the same thing, but I love having that texture to, to create the effects with. Okay. And it's just nice when people are like, how do I use that on a card? Well, you could do way more than that, but that's literally a swatch and a card and a charm. So, a lot of fun. Let's get back to these. Remember these, <laughs> these were the ones with the texture paste. I know the texture paste is dry. I know for a couple reasons. One, my paper started to curl because texture paste as it dries, it wants to like grab. So when your paper takes on like a different bit of a curve, we know that our paste is dry. Also, if you touch the back of it and it's not cool, it's dry. So let's heat these up. Let's start with our little skull. It's got a little bit of crackle on there. Gonna heat emboss this glaze. And let's glaze, glaze up these cracked little skulls. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. I love this color blend. Weathered wood, pumice stone, and lost shadow. Might as well just call it bone dust. It's so good. I'll hold it up as soon as I'm done embossing. Wow. 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 And then on the crackle, ooh, we're going to ink it too. We're going to get a little bit more grungy. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, glaze for days, you'll see. And I know sometimes, you know, I, I'm not holding it up to the perfect angle of the camera, but if you've embossed, you know, you have to like, you have to have it hit the light just so that you can see when it's melted. So you got that glaze done. Ooh -wee. Beautiful. It just adds a whole nother, not only texture, but also adds a whole nother color to it. I think that's what I'm loving about working with it. Okay. Keep that. Perfect. So here's what we've got. So here's what we ended up with. So take a look at that. 
and we're going to we're going to accent the cracks even more but can you see what i mean about that color how it's got a little bit of like blue and gray and then that dark like pumice over that crackle there we go so there's our crackle paste but here's the thing about crackle paste that is also super important um, crackle paste of course it does its thing but when you add something into the cracks that's when you start noticing like all of the stuff and you could try a lot of different things you can do uh, sprays you can do ink pads you can do all sorts of things let me see if i have a spray that will work i think so uh, i'll do a little gather twigs that that could work it might be no this is fine it'll, it'll take me an hour. no no it'll be fine <laughs> uh, so remember paper doesn't have a memory so if your paper curls just uncurl it i know again uh, sometimes makers just really freak out about the things that are so insignificant but it doesn't have a memory so you just just flatten it again all right what we're going to do i think i want this to be a little softer i don't want to go spray stain i'm going to go the ink route because i'm afraid that spray stain is going to be way too much color so let's just let's take this and i'm just going to ink over this real quick just make sure i'm kind of grinding some of that color into those areas don't worry about your ink your ink is going to it'll move when we want it to move so i'll blend this out i'll blend this out i'll blend this out if you have an ink that's really designed to blend, you can do this. You can smash it like that, and then you can blend it. If you can't do that, then the whole blendable, uh, that's debatable. So here, we're just going to add some water. I'm going to add some, I'm going to be pretty, not misting everything, I'm just kind of dripping, and then I'm going to stand it up. So see, I'm going to get, see those little drippies going, going down? That's just, there we go. Haha, <laughs> okay now we can dry this so now i'm just switching perfect so do you have to do all this no but i just wanted you to see because again i live in the world of brown and that's okay that's my happy place if your happy place is pink or blues or yellows use those colors because you can do all of this with that you can have a beautiful blue undertone to this uh, you can have pinks underneath the flower so please don't ever think that because i'm using brown that that's what you have to use i just happen to like it so you have to do you you have to do the things that you like and use the colors that you like okay next i'm just going to take a little bit of water and i just want to wipe over these guys just to take off any excess brown that's sitting on top of the skulls because i liked the color that we gave them okay and now that's what we have so take a look at that see all the the little crackly bits that is awesome. yeah that's what that ink did ink in a little bit of water it just allowed it just allowed the color to kind of seep in there but then we still have that glaze we still have that shininess see that shine right there you can kind of see that reflection that's so cool for a background and again see how that squeegee this is what i was trying to explain like the rubber part of the squeegee almost like creates these little skippity bit jumps um versus just dragging it all in I just love it. Very cool. Nothing better than yeah. skippity bit jumps. That's right. Nothing <laughs> better than that. Um, but yes, picture. yes, see, Christina said yes to pink skulls. You're absolutely right. Yeah. These could be pink, so you could have glazed them with kitsch flamingo, anything that you want. You, that's the beauty of understanding the product. If you understand the product, the palette, that is, that is really where you're, you can just totally expand and explore. So this one, ooh -hoo, this is going to be good. Grungy background. This is translucent grit paste, so this one's going to be way more chunky with glaze. Let's see what happens. There we go. Going to heat this up, and you'll see as it starts to melt. And because these colors are mixed, they actually mix because they're translucent. So you create totally new color blends. Oh, look at that. It just looks like glass. Oh, man. Okay. Okay, so let me point this out. You see right here where I'm getting these little white dots? Those are little bubbles that are not totally dry yet. That's what I meant about it bubbling up. I'm okay with that. But just know that if you want to 100% avoid bubbles, then just let it dry a few hours. Just depends on how you do it. I didn't want to wait a few hours, and I don't mind bubbles because I think they look... It looks more like molten glass, but that's what's causing that. And you can also get rid of them. Like you can heat it 
and then just give it a good thunk on the table and that will often flatten them out. All right, just got to get down here into this purple brown zone. Oh gosh, it turned out so pretty. Let's get this one. Woo -wee. And same thing, I'm not worrying about overheating because it's on paste. You can't. You cannot overheat. Probably one of my favorites, really. Translucent grit paste and glaze, I think it's just a match made in heaven. I think it's so, so good. Um, all right, so take a look at this. See what I mean when I said it looks like glass? Because it does. And you can still see all of that ink drippage underneath it because that's, that, that's why that dot is brighter than the rest because it's still picking up your background. That's why these are darker blue than this because this is over brown, this is over the blue area. So having a translucent glaze, even though you're mixing colors and you think, oh, I'm still putting Mermaid Lagoon over here, because it's translucent, what it's going on is gonna change how that Mermaid Lagoon melts. It just changes. And because of this texture, because it's grit paste, it's so chunky gray and it's totally pliable. So you could die cut these pages still. You, don't, you could do your embossing before or after you die cut. It's not like when you die cut, it's gonna all break apart. Uh, all the textures are totally flexible uh, and pliable. So we could even go and, and ink again. You know, you could, if you wanted something to be a little bit more uh, grunge, we could still go over this guy uh, with crayon. I can even take this and just to show you, like every, every medium you have can really be used uh, to create it. So here I'm just going to create that really dark spot. So you see how that skull is just super dark? But we know what we know. We know what we know because of this technique. And what do we know? Hmm, a crayon is water reactive. So even though I put some crayon over something, I could go in with some water and I could wipe it away. So now I can wipe that away from the top of that glaze. And so I still get the color, but now I got a darker shadow because I connected that technique with that technique because it's all the same. When you understand the properties of a product, how you use it and what you put it on is completely up to you. It's just, it's pretty remarkable. So that really, I think that that does it. There's so many, I mean, I could go on and on. Like I said, glaze for days because I could, because I think that, you know, you never underestimate the power of what you could, could do with things like this one. That's using a stencil, that's using uh, translucent and then just going over with glaze. Oh no, I think this is opaque because we got that bright color. Opaque texture paste and then the colors of glaze. We've got different crackles. See, even that one, a little finer, beautiful. I mean, you could just do so many different things. Oh, look at that little grunge beauty. And I like to work and I like to play with different elements and just pile them up because then when you need to make cards, or projects or elements, you have it. And I think if you allow yourself, it may not work for you. You may not like compartmental making. You may absolutely hate it. But like this background, this was one of the cards I shared. This is texture paste. When we did this in the demo, people were freaking their freak because I didn't finish coloring the tag. You could go watch the Distress Paint Live to see what I was talking about. But they were like, it's unfinished. But then when you crop it, it's like, but it is finished. Look, I, I did that. And I think by creating unfinished backgrounds, you see everything that you've done as perfection. You do, you see every little background that you did as perfection, even if it's totally unfinished, because when you go to use it, it is perfect. And it allows you to kind of get out of your head a little bit more uh, also. So uh, a shout out to Ranger really for allowing me to expand the palette. It's been a long time since we've had um, a lot of colors of glaze. We do add a new color glaze every time we have uh, a new distress color. But with one left, it was nice that we had this, this nice jump of, uh, of colors, of glaze. So many different ways that we can, we can incorporate it, right? Swatches, Halloween, um, stamping. I mean, yeah, glaze for days. Because that, that's what it's all about right there. It really is. Whoop, whoop.